Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another special Hugo is Their podcast panel discussion on the Hugo nominees for 2021. This time we're going to be talking about the dramatic presentation long form, which means movies generally. And I've assembled another panel on quite short notice, as David uh, mentioned earlier. And I only have actually one survivor from the novelettes, and that's Juan San Miguel. Hey, Juan. Hi. Uh, you can find me at Rainbow War 71 on the Twitters and going to enjoy uh, looking at some films. Nice. And then we also have Lori, who is with us uh, for the short stories panel from Hugo Girl. Hi, Lori. Hey, everybody. I'm Lori Anderson. I'm one of the three co hosts, along with Haley and Amy, of the Hugo Girl podcast. And you can find us on social media at Hugo Girl Podcast. Nice. And then I have a couple of uh, familiar voices here, but not necessarily from one of these panels. So I have David Agronoff. Hey, David. Hey, uh, thanks for having me back on Who Goes There, Seth. Yeah. Uh, we covered uh, Clifford Smack on, on here. Uh, yes. But yeah, I'm a co-host of the... Sorry, I had a dog decide to, to make noise right when I was talking. <laughs> uh, um, I'm the co-host of the Dickheads podcast. Uh, we cover all the Philip K. Dick books in order of publication, and we're already in the 70s. And uh, I'm also the author of eight books, including a science fiction novel called Goddamn Killing Machines. So thanks for having me. Yeah. Okay. And then we have Josh Siefel. Hey, Josh. Hi, Seth. Uh, Josh Siefel. I uh, work at a, uh, I'm an administrator at a university, uh, a PhD in church history, uh, of all things. Uh, mm -hmm. Big science fiction fan. Uh, Seth is... Uh, had me on his podcast a few times. Uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, J.R. Ziefel, Z-I-E-F-L-E. -E. I have a podcast and a blog, both on a bit of a hiatus right now, joshuazefel.com, and the podcast is called Christianity Now. So that's me. Was that a riff on Serenity Now from Seinfeld? Well, there was a, a documentary series on Netflix called Documentary Now. Right, then, okay. So that was kind of, but Serenity now works too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then I actually have a couple of guests here who are going to be future guests on the podcast, but have not been on yet, but I've been on their podcast, Steve and Marshall from Androids and Assets. Hey guys. Hello. It's Steve Hello. here. <laughs> and this is Marshall. Hello. Okay. <laughs> and we're, and our podcast is Androids and Assets. We're on social media at Asset Droid. Nice. Okay. And then uh, Trish Madsen also has been on the podcast. Hi, Trish. Hello. Good to be here. Yep. Uh, I'm uh, at P.E. Matson on Twitter. Um, I, uh, I am a co-host of two podcasts in hiatus at the moment on Supergirl and Stargate SG-1. I am a frequent guest on SFF Audio, and I'm also one of the crew of the Skippy and Fanti show, which nice. is one of the podcast finalists this year, although I was not active this last year. Mm. Nice. Okay. And then a couple of new faces and voices, uh, people who were uh, promoted to me from Olev from the Hugo Book Club. So we have Paul Sr. Hi, Paul. Hi there. Glad to be here. Uh, I'm Paul Sr. I am uh, Paul Sr. everywhere on every social media platform, probably the easiest person in the world to find. Just a <laughs> sci-fi buff for a lot of years. And I am on a quest to watch every science fiction movie ever made. Um, almost 2,000 movies deep at this point with almost 8,000 left to go. Uh, I may not make it. And um, I'm also writing a history of silent science fiction movies, which are, uh, which are surprisingly engaging. And uh, if you want to find me, I'm active on Letterboxd at Paul Senior. Over 3,000 reviews. Come check it out. Okay. Nice to have you. And then uh, last but not least, we have Nana. Hey there. Hi, my name's Nana Amwa. Um, that's K underscore Amwa at uh, Twitter. Um, <clears throat> I've been voting into Hugo since like 2015, which was like uh, around my uh, senior year of high school. So I'm sort of uh, green behind the ears. <laughs> Big fan of uh, sci science fiction and fantasy movies and TV. Um, just a recent college graduate. God help me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive into this. Um, I will go over the list that we have here. We have uh, Birds of Prey or the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn. We have Tenet, 
then Palm Springs, Soul, The Old Guard, and Eurovision Song Contest, the story of Fire Saga. So um, we're going to go through them in that order, and I have recappers for each one. I do want to mention to people, we're not going to do a deep dive on any one of these movies. We're just going to hit some of the high points, things that we liked, things that we didn't like in some cases, um, and uh, yeah, should be fun. So we'll, we'll be here for an hour and change, I'm sure, um, and uh, why don't we kick it off? So does anybody have any opening statements about the, the crop of Hugo nominees this year? Anything anybody wants to say? Seth, uh, I do have. I did have one question. Maybe it'll come up. Mm -hmm. This was pandemic year, so does does this? Yeah. How, the question will come up probably by the end. How much did this affect the number and quality of movies we had to choose from? Mm. Oh, it sense. absolutely did. Yeah, yeah, I think so because, I mean, if you look at, I think the only one of these that actually had a theatrical release. Like, well, Birds of Prey was before the pandemic, but then Tenet was the only other one. And so many of the movies that came out this year were, were totally affected by that. Dune would have been a 2020 movie right. had the pandemic not happened. And I think we're all pretty sure that that would have gotten nominated if, if, if it was here. I remember I the it. theatrical release was this big controversial thing. Like Chris Nolan, I remember he was adamant about Tenet needing to be in theaters. And there was like a little discourse on both sides. One side was saying that Tenet in theaters was irresponsible. The other side, uh, like, took the right precautions so that it could work in theaters. And I think, like, uh, Tenet kind of took a financial, wasn't as financially uh, profitable as people thought it'd be. So, like, in some ways, that sort of, I think that confirmed the other side's uh, notion. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, Josh, what you said makes a lot of sense that the pandemic year definitely changed the crop of movies that we had available to nominate. But on the other hand, I found um, when I was trying, for instance, I like to watch all the like Academy Award nominees, and it was way easier to get to all of them in the pandemic year because everything was available on streaming. Um, so you'd think that would kind of democratize the whole thing and maybe, but maybe we didn't get as many releases because people did push them out like um, I think David said Dune was going to come out this uh, in 2020, but it didn't. So, okay. Um, why don't we go ahead and dive in? We will talk about Birds of Prey. Um, for the quick recap of that one, I have Trish down. If she can find the mute button. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I am working on a strange to me computer. I do not have my notes. So off the top of my head, um, <laughs> After Harley gets dropped by her awful boyfriend, she goes on a tear uh, at a nightclub. She um, ends up owing a favor to the uh, very egotistical owner, uh, Roman Sionis. Um, uh, after that, she blows up Ace Chemicals to mark her emancipation from her boyfriend and uh, runs into a young girl who it turns out has stolen a diamond from Victor Saz, the hitman for Roman Sionis, the nightclub owner and gang leader. Um, lots and lots of things happen uh, and in involving uh, repeated efforts by Harley to eat her beloved egg sandwich. Um, and <laughs> uh, at the end, there's a, a, a huge fight confrontation and alliance at an amusement at abandoned music park involving Harley, Roman, Sionis, Detective Montoya, the Huntress, Dinah Lance, possibly some others, some flunkies and stuff. Uh, it's an absolutely fabulous movie. And at the end, the Birds of Prey split off doing their things, which are Detective Mon no, ex Detective Montoya, uh, the Huntress, and uh, Dinah Lance, Black Canary, and Harley and uh, Cassandra, the young pickpocket, uh, go off to enjoy a life of crime together. Nice. The end. I do feel like this movie was probably mistitled because it's definitely a Harley Quinn movie. And if they mm -hmm. had just gone, you know, Harley Quinn, Birds of Prey, that would have been a little more, uh, probably a better title. But I don't know what anybody else on this. This was the last movie I saw in theaters it prior the to the pandemic shutting everything down. Yeah. This was the last mo major movie I saw in theaters. I think I saw a few indie films at our local 
art house cinema here in Orlando. This mm. is off the top of my head. This is just a fun action adventure film. And 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 a little character development in Harley, obviously, to be less codependent with a psychopathic boyfriend. <laughs> so it's it's fun all around. I think it's it's a million smile movie. I love that a lot of the characters get their own little moments. Like you yeah. see uh, uh, the huntress practicing in a mirror. You know her big lines of when she right. she's been the, the mysterious crossbow killer vigilante, and you see her practicing in a mirror so that when she yeah. reveals. She's the huntress. Taxi driver. No. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just awesome. And I love that actress too. She was in the short lived uh, Brain Dead TV series and um, in some other stuff that I, I uh, have seen before that I liked a lot. So I would love to see her in another feature film or series. Yeah. You're talking about Mary Elizabeth Winstead? Yes. Yes. Yeah. She was in Sky High, which is a fantastic uh, superhero comedy. <laughs> Huh, I'll have I, to check that out. I love how you went for Sky High instead of Scott Pilgrim. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah, that, that too. And that, that is a terrific movie as well. So, <laughs> Well, I, I would say that, that I, of course, start talking when a plane's going over. But um, the thing about it is, for me, was Birds of Prey was a movie I wasn't going to watch until we did this panel. Yeah. So, and I admit that I just, I had zero interest in it beforehand. And so I went with a very low bar because I thought Suicide Squad was unwatchable. The first I didn't see one, that one. The second one. Okay. Yeah. I actually like the second one, the, the James Gunn one. But, and so that, you know, I wouldn't have watched this if it hadn't been for this panel. And I will say it was much better than I expected. And I think Margot Robbie doing you know, action scenes and roller skates while producing the movie is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I, and I, I, I'm sad that the movie didn't do as well because I thought the director, Kathy Yan, I watched a couple interviews with her after I watched the movie and I thought she was pretty impressive. And I think what I wish they had done with Birds of Prey, which I think would have made it more, I think it was aggressively okay. But what I think would have made it really good is if they had gone more surreal with the unreliable narrator part of Harley mm. Quinn telling the story and had it been like a little bit more insane I think that would have been a little bit neater but for the most part like my expectations were so low so you know I wasn't mad at you Seth for making me watch <laughs> uh, we'll get to at some point but uh, yeah and I will say I you know, it, it definitely was better than I thought it would be. Yeah, yeah. Lori, go ahead. Um, yeah, I wanted to say I agree with everything that Juan said, and in particular about her character development. I have um, never really been like a DC person. I mean, I'm fine with it, but I'm not like a DC follower or fan or anything. And in particular, um, my professional background is with domestic violence as an attorney. And so the Joker Harley Quinn relationship is not something that is ever been cute to me you know I kind of like side eye I see a lot of Harley Quinn cosplay it's a super popular cosplay and I'm always kind of like oh, everybody this isn't this isn't fun um and so I wasn't super excited to see this movie um I actually watched it maybe like a month or two ago and I was so surprised at how much I enjoyed it and I think that they did a great job um kind of almost rehabbing her character arc and, you know, coming from that very dark place and coming out of it in a way that I think really worked mm -hmm. um, because that character is also dealing with um, the background of it, like with the therapist who falls in love with the um, client or patient. I mean, that's like a kind of a gross stereotype. And um, so, you know, that, that wasn't great. And I really think they um, have rehabilitated a lot of that and made her a character that I'm interested in following now. And then also wanted to mention, um, so it's funny because I, I, you know, was never into the cosplay of Harley Quinn previously. And then after I saw this movie, I decided to do a cosplay of her from Birds of Prey at Dragon Con this year. So I was studying her tattoos. And um, for this movie, they removed the tattoo that says rotten along her jawline. And that was a choice um, 
she didn't like it and um, James Gunn didn't like it. And they were like, okay, well, we won't even, we don't even need a story. We're just going to get rid of it. Like it was never there. Hmm. Um, so I, I really appreciated how they've um, taken the character in a new direction. And also just on top of that, the movie I thought was super fun. It was colorful. I loved the costumes. And then um, I also found out that Journey Smollett who played Black Canary did the, her musical performances herself. And hmm. I was blown away by that. Um, and I, I liked her on Lovecraft Country as well. So I was excited yeah. to see her again. And her musical performances were amazing. Hmm. Yeah, she's great. Um, there's some talk of a possible spinoff for her, uh, Diane yeah. Lance. And I would absolutely love to watch that. Yeah, yeah, me too. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, so this is a movie I saw. I think this may have been the last one I saw in, in normal ways until through the pandemic. Although I was on vacation and saw this movie in a drive-in theater thinking that mm. was whimsical. Little did I know that in three months that was the only way that I could see a, a movie right. in, in some sense. Um, all, I all I would say is, you know, I mean, Margot Robbie to Harley Quinn is like Johnny Depp to Jack Sparrow, I guess. I mean, she just sort of found the character that uh, she, she inhabits a little bit. Um, when it comes to DC movies, I mean, I, I'm not a big comic book guy so i can't comment on a lot on a lot of the larger debate i mean dc is all over the place but i think in this kind of vein maybe if maybe if they adopted this as their style this would be <laughs> this would be the, the way to go i mean i also now i'm thinking about this movie i've seen it once and then i saw a, a suicide squad 2 after it so it's all kind of merging together in my mind a little yeah. bit but definitely i think i i think that um it's a direction that they've definitely gone with some of these movies and which they sort of like don't do with their tentpole movies. They say, here, here's this other movie, do whatever you want. And it tends to be a lot more interesting than when they try to make the big competing with Marvel style movies that don't haven't seemed to work as well with the exception, I guess, of Wonder Woman, the first mm -hmm. one. Yeah. I, you know, I am a big DC person. I grew up reading DC comics. Um, not, not really Batman, not really Harley Quinn, anything like that. It was more like Teen Titans. But um, so I really want the DC movies to be good. And so I love it when I actually enjoy one. And this is one that I liked. So um, let's see, go ahead, uh, Steve. Yeah, so I, pursuant to Lori's comment, uh, my work also brings me into contact and has brought me into contact with a lot of incarcerated and recently incarcerated women. And um, Harley Quinn is the closest thing to a living like a patron saint of incarcerated women mm. um she matters so much um to 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 a seg at least a segment of that community obviously it's not a homogenous mm. group by any means but the way yeah the way she is represented super matters to some very vulnerable people mm. um so it's, i think it is really important the handling of her representation is super important um and i think yeah this was this was a huge step up from Suicide yeah. Squad. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think like there's a big, having the Harley Quinn property as a creator is a huge responsibility. Yeah. Because because the influence she wields, like they would make pictures of her and they would put them up in their cells, you know, like it was, mm -hmm. I was blown away. It was the closest thing to a like, a living religion. <laughs> Interesting. You know, um, a, 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 a new religion emerging that I could think of. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Go ahead, Nana. Um, right. Well, um, I think one interesting thing about Birds of Prey is that it might, um, despite being um, low key compared to the rest of the big DC temples, it might be a important transitional film in the DC EU. Because like yeah. prior to Birds of Prey, we were getting stuff like uh, uh, Justice League and uh, the original Suicide Squad. I think movies that were characterized by their um, dark, uh, I guess, edgy masculine settings and i say that as someone who likes just the justice league snyder cut um even wonder woman uh, had that snyder co-writing credit it was sort of it had those moments where it's like a big um serious um superhero movie but birds of prey with uh margot robbie having more of a creative role in the characterization of harley quinn it sort of i feel like it shifted to dceu a little bit and because right after we got the Suicide Squad, which I really enjoyed, it might be my favorite film out of the bunch. Um, mm. Where um, the the tone was, it sort of hit this tone of being like both fun and having excellent characterization, and 
I guess like birds of prey um should be um commended for um I guess creating a little shift. Yeah, you mentioned over in the chat that it's not really a genre film, but I you know there's a, a long history of the Hugos nominating superhero films. So oh no, I was talking about Ease by You, but that was also oh my, okay. Uh, yeah, Birds of Prey. Um gotcha, okay. It is sort of like more of an action film than like a genre film. And I guess mm. that the, that's like that sort of genre distinction where some superhero films go in all in on the sci-fi fantasy aesthetic and some superhero films are just really realistic. Yeah. And I guess as voters, it's our, it's our job to like decide how much of a genre film it is. Yeah. I see. I misread your, your uh, chat entry there. Uh, David, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, yeah, just real quickly, I wanted to say, uh, God, every time I unmute, something makes a sound. Um, <laughs> and it's totally quiet otherwise. Um, the director, Kathy Yan, said that Margot Robbie was very involved in wanting to rehab the character, but they also put a lot of effort into making sure that the, the costumes and the outfits were not, like, super male gazy. Yeah. And, like, comparatively to the past, that was, that was a big deal. And I think for a superhero movie, that that is an actually underrated thing that this movie did. Yeah. So, and that's because there were women all up and down the board making it. Yep. Trish, go ahead. Oh, you're on mute, Trish. <laughs> it had to happen Sorry. at least once. Yes, yes. Sorry, I typed this in chat before, but since cosplay came up again, I'll say I read an interview where they um, specifically uh, designed the costumes for Harley to be accessible for cosplayers to create. And that logically makes sense since uh, Harley was, you know, living in an apartment over a restaurant at the time, so allegedly poor and creating mm -hmm. her costumes out of whatever. But it's just such a thoughtful touch from the uh, the uh, uh, director and whoever was else was, well, the costume designer to make that happen to be fan, uh, fan accessible. Yeah. All right, any other comments on Birds of Prey or shall we move on? Um, someone brought up like how it maybe should have been called Harley Quinn and the Birds of Prey. It was like, it was very Harley focused. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when the movie was coming out that really confused me because I'm not a super comic reader, but I have some familiarity with um, characters from Marvel and DC. And my mm -hmm. image of Birds of Prey is Barbara Gordon in a wheelchair as the Oracle. And so like, I was wondering, is Harley Quinn in the Birds of Prey in the comics now, like prior to the movies coming out or was that just something they invented for the movie? I can feel that she was not in the Gail Simone uh, run of the book. I don't know if she came in later. On the other hand, I really do like a, a very prolix title, you know, like the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford, you know, so it's fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, shall we go ahead and move on? All right. So we'll move on to Tenet. Uh, Juan, you have recapping duties and may God have mercy on your soul. Well, I'm going to keep it simple. I mean, Tenant is essentially an action adventure film uh, with a big idea, a big idea that someone has figured out to manipulate time going backwards. We are given a protagonist who's an agent supposedly for the CIA. He has no name other than the protagonist, and he's investigating who has this ability and what they're going to do with it. Uh, I think that's a very good overview of the plot. It gets the quote, it gets wibbly wobbly timey wimey pretty quick, but I think right. in an interesting way. My own opinion of the film is I think it's it's beautifully shot. I could see why Warner Brothers wanted to see if this could put people back in the theaters. Uh, the biggest weakness, and may, I should have put the weakness first before praising it, is that unfortunately I think that they leave uh, the protagonist somewhat underdeveloped and actually they're doing something that Stephen Barnes has been complaining of not realizing him as a full a uh, person by not making him not, you know, have an intimate relationship with the lead. I mean, this is a James Bond like film and mm -hmm. he, he doesn't get the girl. I mean, and that's something that's been bothering uh, Steve Barnes and Steve, if I got this wrong, please come back and tell me, but I know you've been harping about this for years. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. Hi. Yes. Okay. So my 
criticism of Tenet, and I'm interested, this might be controversial, but Tenet seems to be an anti-climate action movie. Okay, explain. In the sense that it's about, <laughs> it's about like a future of touched by climate change that is essentially attempting to rewrite, attempting to destroy the past mm -hmm. to avert the climate catastrophe. Um, and so the reaction then of the, you know, of the of protagonist is to save the present. Right. Um, but there's no, like it is, it, it, it's locked into polarization, right? There's either we are destroyed by the future, we're destroyed in the name of the future, or we continue on our current course. Mm -hmm. And by creating that, that, that diametric opposition between those two things, erases climate action hmm. as a viable option. And I think it speaks to like the broader Nolan conservatism that we all know and love. Yeah, I was going to say that sounds like it would be in conversation with the in interstellar, right? We're not meant to save yeah. the planet. We're meant to leave it. And yes. I think no, that's, that's not necessarily the right way to think about things. Yeah, I like The Dark Knight a lot, but that's a movie that's ultimately, um, even if it disagrees with the methods Batman takes in terms of like surveilling the senses of Gotham, it's ultimately positive behind it reasoning and impetus behind the war terror that was happening at the time which um yeah we yeah go ahead josh yeah you, you guys will probably hear me say this about a few of the movies today but i feel like i've seen this movie before in a certain sense um <laughs> no i haven't seen this concept on film but right I didn't wasn't interested in watching this movie at all. Matter of fact, I just watched it Friday night in preparation for this podcast. And a lot of times when I do that, I am pleasantly surprised. I was really not pleasantly surprised. Mm. I watched it. I said, okay. I was really disappointed. Amazon made me pay $14 for it to, to download it and watch it. Um, I don't know whether it's, it's an, another Nolan movie that deals with time, although at least the audio was clear this time, which was a big, a big plus for, uh, for me. Um, it, um, I also wasn't, um, I wasn't, I wasn't in love with the big idea concept of entropy moving backwards and whatnot. It was a little hard to grasp the context, the concept rather, and then to figure out the implications live when I'm watching the movie was very, well, for me at least, uh, I felt like I didn't, I could only, I only had a vague grasp sometimes at what was exactly going on and that there might've been larger things that um, Nolan was trying to say that I could not figure out while the movie was running. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't really have any desire to see it again. It was beautiful. Um, well done. Robert Pattinson has left Twilight behind and I'm sure he's very happy about that. But mm -hmm. yeah, those are my thoughts about it. Yeah. I, I guess I didn't say my thoughts. I, I, I enjoyed this one. I, I'm a big fan of uh, Nolan's films, but this one doesn't make the you know top three or four for me um, in terms of Christopher Nolan. I like The Prestige better, Inception, Memento, Dunkirk. I did watch this one. Um, you know, I, I ended up just buying it because I figured I'd watch it more than one time and watched it the first time. I had heard that there was a uh, problem with the audio mix and I deliberately did not turn on the captioning the first time I watched it and found out that indeed there is some trouble with the audio mix. And so that when I watched it again with my wife, we watched it with the, with the captions on and that, that helped explain some of the stuff in the movie. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I found it enjoyable. Uh, David, go ahead. Yeah. So um, everybody who just watched it once um, I'm telling you watch, watch it again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Cause here's the thing I, I saw it. Um, right around the time that it came out on video, I was not comfortable seeing it in the theater at the time. Uh, it's the only Nolan movie I haven't seen in the theater. I'm a Nolan defender. I even like Interstellar. I will fight people on Interstellar, um, <laughs> which is, however, when I saw this, I was just like, meh. And I was like, I don't get it. I, I think it looks really neat. And, and I probably wasn't going to watch it again until this panel and last night I watched it again and then um oh my god it's way better than I thought the first time and I know you can say that about like look Mulholland Drive by David Lynch was the same way for me the first time I saw it I had no idea and then the second time I watched Mulholland Drive I felt like an idiot because I didn't get it the first time and it's all very obvious 
there's a lot of things going on that I guarantee, like, how many of you even realize that Robert Pattinson was the son of Sean Bean and that, that woman? Because I didn't get that the first time. Right, exactly. And I'm not saying that that's a good argument for the movie. It's an argument that a lot will pass you by. I also didn't realize the first time that the time travelers were starting hundreds of years in the future. Right. The first time I saw it, I didn't get that. I didn't get lots of things. Mm -hmm. And so the second time when I was kind of piecing together the timeline, and I will admit that there were several times I rewound and watched scenes again. Mm -hmm. And that's not an argument for the movie being perfect. That's an argument for that there's more going on than people realize at first. This is the only movie of all these movies nominated that I think is worthy of being here. I still like personally, if I was like picking my nominees, it would be the last, there are three or four movies I would put ahead of it for 2020. Hmm. We'll get to that later. But I do think that Tenet is a movie that you should wait a little while and watch it again. And then um, you will catch things you didn't catch the first time. Protagonist, the main character, there's a lot more going on there than you realize. The first time it's so confusing. You're so confused. You have no idea what's going on and you miss a lot of things. And that's one of the reasons why you have to go back and watch it again, hmm. because I guarantee you, and look, this is not the first time Nolan's done this. Right. Did anybody get Memento the first time you saw it? <laughs> you didn't. You caught things when you saw it multiple times and that's yeah. okay. That's okay. Yeah. I mean, that's your mileage may vary, right? Not everybody yeah. wants to watch a movie twice. So uh, go ahead, Lori. Um, so I watched Tenet yesterday and I did not understand a lot of what was going on, but I'm like pretty okay with that. I kind of thought I wouldn't. I mean, anything with like time travel, I just have to kind of go, okay, <laughs> that's fine. Um, so I was like, I was fairly comfortable with that. Um, but I, so I was talking with my husband, Kevin, who some of y'all have, have met um, over podcasts and Zoom. And, uh, and he made a point this morning that he thinks Christopher Nolan movies, um, what he likes about them is that they often take sort of a B movie idea and then make like a film out of it. And so he was like, you know, what? Well, he just sort of says, what if we could make time go backwards and then right. like makes a big fancy film or like, what if we could run around inside dreams and makes a big fancy movie out of it. So um, I thought that was a kind of a neat observation. Um, and, and so I think like, if you can just sort of sit back and be comfortable with not understanding everything, it's enjoyable. Um, and, I did enjoy watching it. It won't be at the top of my ballot, but I enjoyed watching it. I paid attention to it and it's quite long. Mm -hmm. So if I will look at a whole movie and not pick up my phone, I think that speaks well for the movie. Yeah. Um, but I was surprised by, I thought that the protagonist was underdeveloped and I wondered if we're like looking for sequels down the road or something. And, and I liked the comparison. I think maybe it was Juan who made the comparison to a Bond movie. Um, I did think... I, I felt like it was more of almost Robert Pattinson's movie. Mm -hmm. Once he entered, I felt like he kind of stole the scenes. He knew way more than, of what was going on. And, uh, you know, I, I liked the twist at the end, which I don't know if we really want to give that away, but I, I liked that. Um, but it made me feel like it was teed up for a sequel. And I don't know if that's something that maybe is known if that's going to happen or not, if anybody has any intel on that. It. But I, I mean, I would watch an, I would watch a sequel because I would like to know more of what's going on and where everybody's from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, him being the son of the, of the villain and being trained by protagonist, I, a lot, and most people did not get that and it, it, in the first viewing. And I think that does set up for the future. And it does, I think, Lori, your argument that that's his movie, in many ways, that's true. But I do think protagonist is deeper than people are giving him credit for. And um, no, no offense to Stephen Barnes, but who gives a shit about who ends up with who? I don't care. That's really 20th century thinking, and I don't care about that in a movie. And I actually think that that is, um, I actually think that's a charming thing about the movie, that that wasn't his motivation. His motivation was saving the future. Mm -hmm. And um, he does go to save her life, but it's not about a romantic thing. Right. It's about... And what we find out later, too, is that she's the mother of, of his partner. So that's a, right. a bit, yeah. And it's just 20th century thinking, and I'm not going to care about that. But, it, you know, but, Laurie, I think you bring up lots of good points. And 
And I do think you should watch it again in a little while. Yeah. Can I sneak in here and say I'm not Stephen Barnes or whoever okay. you are talking about? Like, I, I'm not that guy. I just want to, for the listener. All right. Sounds good. Uh, go ahead, Marshall. I don't think people can make that mistake if they know Stephen Barnes. Uh, yeah, I, um, I always have a problem with a movie that is like, you have to watch it twice to get it. Um, if, if you can't explain it in a movie... Uh, then, then I think that was a failure in making a movie. Hmm. Um, there's things that you can watch a second time and get more out of, but if you can't get it the first time, then uh, then that was a mistake, uh, and and that movie was an error. Like that's that's just how it is. It's a story, and if you can't get it, and you have to hear the story three times for you're like, oh, I finally get it. Then that's a bad story, uh, and you should go back and edit until people can get it. Hmm. Uh, you can you I, can have more depth than that, and that's fine. Yeah, but but the the whole thing has to come across, or well, I, I don't I don't enjoy. There's it. a difference between a movie that you need to watch more than once to get it, and one that rewards a rewatch. Um, yeah, and and there's a middle ground there somewhere. But you know, like a movie like 2001, right? I watched it the first time, and I went, I don't know what I just watched, and it, it took a few viewings on that one for me to be able to kind of sit back and just take it for what it was and re and really enjoy it. Um, David, you seem to vehemently disagree with that. Oh, God, I disagree so much. <laughs> um, look, I do a Phil K. Dick podcast, and his masterpiece is Three Sigma of Palmer Eldridge, and that book has to be read multiple times to be gotten. And it's rewarding each and every time for different reasons. And, and, and I think if something is weird enough, if you can make something weird enough that the artist understands what they're doing, like David Lynch, like there's no way you can tell me that every David Lynch movie could be understood. Twin Peaks, there's people are still trying to unpack what's happening for Twin Peaks. And, you know, I think that's great. Like I want to be weirded out sometimes. I want to, to be confused. I think that's a great feeling. Just don't bore me. You can confuse me, but don't bore me. Hmm. But as long as I'm excited, I'll, I'll watch the thing a couple of times. Dark City is one of my favorite movies. The first time I saw it, I had no idea what was going on. I was like, what the hell is this mess? And I love that movie now, you know, mm. so I, I, I just, you know, no offense, Marshall. I like your podcast. I listen to it. I just disagree with you Thanks. wholeheartedly on that one. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, the thing that I, um, something that pulled me out of the movie every time that happened was when the protagonist referred to himself as the protagonist. Right. And I hated it so <laughs> much because whoever talks about themselves in their regular everyday life as I am the protagonist in right. what story you're not in a story. You don't know you're in a story. Mm -hmm. You're in your life. You're you're a person. Yeah, it bothered me. Oh, I disagree. End. In Tenet, he definitely knows he's in a story because he definitely knows that he's being. This is a story that's. That it's not a story. It's his the life. are coming from the future. It's he's in his the past life. He knows that he. If is he the knows story. it's a story, then he knows it's not real, and he can stop doing anything because it doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, I, I so disagree. He is. He knows he's in a story. Period. Like, I, I thought that was great. Then it has I, absolutely no impact and we shouldn't care. <laughs> if he knows it's a story and it's not a real thing, it's not his actual life, then there's no stakes to it whatsoever. Well, All right, thank, thank you I everyone mean, for coming to debate night. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, I, I like, I, I love discussion, so I'm yeah, fine yeah, yeah. with it. But. Yeah, no, it's cool. Um, I do want to shout out Elizabeth Debicki. I think she's absolutely tremendous in the movie. Um, and she's really good in Widows. Was it Widows? I think that was what it's called. Um, yeah, an actor that I'd like to see in more movies. Go ahead, Laurie. Oh, and then, sorry, the last thing that I was going to say was I just really, I also enjoyed um, all of the things when he was dealing with the, the world of wealth and power and he couldn't fit in. Right. Like he would he would try, but there was always a tell that they were like, "Yeah, you don't belong here. Like, mm -hmm. if you're not if you're not born to this, you just don't get it, and you're not one of us. And we we know that you're not one of us." Yeah, um, it was kind of a a fun little thing about yeah yeah the, the rich and powerful. Mm -hmm. Lori, did you accidentally have your hand up? Or yeah, I think I forgot okay. to lower it, and also my neighbor is somehow running multiple leaf blowers right now so i'm gonna stay on mute for a little while <laughs> okay <laughs> sounds good all right uh any other comments on tenet before we move along oh by the way i forgot to mention um where people can find these movies if they want to uh birds of prey is available on hbo max as is tenet so 
I'll, I'll, I'll note that for the rest of the movies. So we're going to move on to uh, Palm Springs. And for our recap on that one, we have Paul. Oh, there we go. Oh, Palm Springs. Um, first of all, I like to say that this is an absolutely delightful film. It was beautifully constructed, nicely shot um, and edited. Uh, it's it's a nice light snack, I thought. It's really a romantic comedy with a bit of a coating of science fiction paint. And uh, it sort of mutates several times. It starts out as pretty much a straight comedy. Oh, I'd also like to say it was written by, uh, by Andy Ciara and directed by Max Barbacow. And uh, good job, guys, because it starts out like, you, you know, the shape of it. It's a, there's a guy at a wedding. He's Andy Samberg, kind of like a budget <laughs> Bill Murray. And he's, uh, you know, he's a boor at a wedding and he's drinking and he's super inappropriate. And whoa, look at this guy. And then he meets a young lady and, you know, they kind of strike up a thing and they, they, but he's acting really oddly. And they ended up wandering out into the desert. They find a cave. There's some special effects. And she wakes up back into her bed on the morning of the wedding and you know this causes her to freak out and she conf confronts yeah he conf uh, confronts Sandberg's character and says you know what the heck and so that they spend a while sort of acute Accl acclimating to their new life of time looping so it's a it's the shape of a story that we've seen a lot of but it's but it does kind of mutate like we've seen it in like 50 first dates and edge of tomorrow uh before i fall a happy death day russian doll from last year all dealing with or vivarium from this year which i really liked um that all dealing with infinite loops but i think this one is a bit different because it drops us it's it's really smart in that it drops us into the middle of the story mm -hmm. um so samberg's uh, character has been living possibly for centuries in this time loop and and then when um uh, when the girl falls into it, uh, she has to deal with it. And so they have some really fun scenes, two sets of fun scenes where the characters have to kind of deal with their new situation and kind of play with it a little bit. Um, just really fun. And so uh, then they have to try and figure out a way out. And so they do the usual things. Oh, I have to be a good person. I have to do this and that. And and uh, eventually they do they find a way out. Yep, they find a way out. Um, but uh, a very enjoyable little romp. Um, just beautifully edited and dropping you into the middle of the story I thought was a genius idea it really shakes it up from all the other time loop movies where you sort of you know like you start it with the protagonist the main character but this one you know you don't and uh good job on them excellent excellent film a solid four out of five for me yeah and this one's available on Hulu just in case anybody wanted to go find it now and, um, and Netflix is... it was it was a big hit on Netflix last year oh in the States, it's on Hulu. Um, oh, okay. So, yeah. I, I guess I should uh, specify that, that, you know, streaming services being what they are. Um, gotcha. This is one that I came to completely blind. I had never seen the trailer for it, didn't know anything about it. My son was just like, hey, this was a fun movie. You should watch it. And so so we watched it together. And yeah, really, really fun. Uh, you know, an old formula, but uh, executed really, really well. Yeah. Uh, I also but, really liked um, um, the inclusion of the location of Bronson Caves just outside yeah. of L.A., and I'm like, you know, that's been used as a location for science fiction for over a century. Mm -hmm. So it was just, it was good to see it. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead, Nana? All right. A couple of things. Um, Palm Spring was like the only nominee that was on my ballot. So it's like my first choice to win the category. I enjoyed this film. Um, Christian Melody and Andy Sandberg have an excellent chemistry. And this film was actually pretty, um, I thought it was, a pretty well done science fiction film in its own right beyond being a romantic comedy and <laughs> a couple of things about it um palm springs it came it, it hit the uh festival circus circuit way before um COVID hit but i noticed that it got its streaming release like right around the time the pandemic was really hitting up and people were getting their orders to stay inside so there are a lot of think pieces and writing online about like how it felt extremely resonant to the current situation. I was wondering yeah. uh, how much it resonated with you guys around the time you saw it. And like, it, it wasn't intentional, but do you think like it, it, fit, it earns its moniker as like the ultimate COVID movie? <laughs> and also um, Paul Sr. brought this up in his talk, but it comes at, at the tail end of a, uh, wave of time loop 
films and TV shows that hit in the 2010s. And I was wondering like, how, how, why, how come there were so many um, time, loop, time loop media in the 2010s? Like, was it just like a huge coincidence or was it like something within the times? Hmm. I feel like it was because people grew up playing video games and having uh, save and restore points. <laughs> Yeah, Russian Doll was uh, explicitly modern pattern after video games. I noticed that they made the main character a game developer. And like, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, so this is another one that I would say I feel like I've seen this before, but that's a that's a meta joke, I suppose. I mean, obviously, this is this was a kind of um, uh, a kind of updating in some sense of that Groundhog Day formula and other things as we've mentioned. I love this movie though. Uh, I really did. This was, uh, I like it. I mean, a confession, I like Andy Samberg, some don't. Um, and Kristen mm -hmm. Milioti won my heart as the oh, mother yeah. in How I Met Your Mother. Although that's another story that I was just angry about that final episode of the series the other day again. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think it, it just had a kind of energy to it and an unexpected kind of romantic comedy. And there were also some moments that I thought were just, um, <sighs> just sharp. The movie was crisp to me. Um, Nana, to go to your question about the pandemic, I mean, I like all of us, I saw this, uh, you know, in my TV in my living room when I couldn't go anywhere. And I don't, I don't know that I thought about um, the pandemic uh, in the same sense when I was watching it, but there, like in Groundhog Day and, and in this movie, kind of in maybe the middle third, there's that, there's that, I don't know, half an hour of ennui or whatever, when they realize they're stuck in this loop forever. And I do think, <laughs> I do think maybe at this um, at this uh, at a guttural level that did hit probably a lot of us at the time, and I think I think that it was um, yeah, it was just it was just a really bright movie for me. You know, some of the movies on this list I feel like I've seen before, and that bores me. In this case, I saw this before; I've seen this movie before, but it kind of grabbed me in a new way, and I I, I like that a lot. So this is one that I I um, I'm excited when I hear people have seen it, and I kind of. Uh, I want to watch it again. So yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Trish. Um, right. This also reminded me of Groundhog Day, but in a in a great way. I really feel like this was in conversation with that movie, not just inspired by it. Because I loved Groundhog Day back when it came out, but I can hardly bear it bear to watch it now because. Bill Murray is such a jerk, and I feel like some of those issues are addressed in this movie. And uh, um, uh, it, you know, it was said that you know they figured out how to get out of the loop. No, he was finally coasting through days. He had given up. She set herself to learn quantum physics and stuff. Um, yeah. So I really liked her agency in this once she uh, figured out what was going on. And I also liked, you know, there was other stuff going on too. There was the guy who hated Andy Samberg and I thought he was <laughs> an interesting addition to the plot. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it, it, it is a really just fun as a romantic comedy. I, you know, there weren't, I didn't worry about any of the plot points because it just went so smoothly. You know, there was nothing to catch me and make me, well, that doesn't really make sense. It just, uh, it just really worked well and there was a lot going on. So um, yeah, it was, it, I think it's probably top of my list. Nice. Go ahead, Juan. Uh, I'm Trish almost grabbed all my talking points, actually. I mean, the thing is, I think what I like, what made it different, because it does follow very closely with, with Groundhog Day in the sense that you go through a period of you don't understand, and then you go through your, uh, you know, your, uh, you go through your party period, for lack of a better word. I was looking for a better word. Uh, oh, your hedonistic period. And then, and then the thing is, the, the Groundhog's Day solution of, you know, trying to make a perfect day doesn't work here. And then our, our heroine has got to find the solution by studying quantum mechanics and even, you know, becoming a scientist, essentially, to solve the problem and for them to get out of it. And also the fact is, I think rarely you ever have an antagonist or an active antagonist uh, going at you and also trying to give that, uh, making that, can, that antagonist have some depth. You know, we try to find out what he's about and, you know, why he's angry. Um, with our with our hero, you know, of bringing him into the situation, and this I think this was the COVID film. I mean, I think I heard the you know got a lot of 
I guess marketing was very good because I heard about it and I checked it out on Hulu and, and you know, it's a fun movie, you know, and it was in the middle of lockdown. So maybe it is the COVID film. Mm-hmm. I will say it's got a great movie poster. Uh, the, the kind of infinite pool looking thing is fantastic. Most movie posters today really suck. So um, go ahead, David. Yeah, I'll try to be quick. Um, JK Simmons was the MVP for me uh, in this, like, as the guy who hates Andy Samberg, like, um, I thought he was great. Uh, I did really love the movie. I think it works better if you don't know that it's a time loop movie going in, uh, which I didn't. I had no idea what it was about. I just knew it was an Andy Samberg movie, turned it on. Um, and so there was definitely time before I realized it was a time loop movie, and those moments were particularly hilarious and uncomfortable at times. And one thing that I will say was interesting is that this movie played at the drive-in here in San Diego, like on the way out in the East County. And it played for a month and a half there and it was very popular. Hmm. And people were going back multiple times to see it. And like, I had coworkers that were saying to me like, oh, you should go see Palm Springs at the drive-in. And I was like, I've already seen it. And they were talking about how people were like yelling lines and doing like, there was Mm. like a whole thing where people were coming back and seeing it multiple times, which is very meta. And uh, so I think that was kind of cool. And I do think that um, this is the only, this and Tenet are the two that I think are, are really, really, really worthy of being here on this list, the nomination, in my opinion. Although I don't know that it would have made my final uh, in relation to the other movies that were that were nominated, I don't know. But I do think it's it's a worthy movie, and I thought it was good. And it's cute, and you know that's a rare thing you can say for a science fiction movie. So yay! Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I also want to say that it, it was very funny. Very, we laughed our butts off. Just yeah. a really, really crowd pleasing and uh, amusing in that way. You know, like I don't know if it's going to draw a lot of people into science fiction, but it was an awfully entertaining and a really good time. And it was sort of I, I'm interested. Nobody's really mentioned the fact that it's got a bit of the Twilight Zone feel to it in the sense that it's ordinary people that are dealing with an extraordinary situation and they're just sort of floundering at first and they're mastering it. Uh, But yeah, great iteration of that kind of story. Yeah. Lori, go ahead. Hey, I've moved it to a different room in hopes of escaping the leaf blowers. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I I did not initially want to watch this movie because I just thought it's a time loop. I get it. I, I, you know, I feel like I've seen that a million times and then it, was they did do it differently and they did make it fresh and I really enjoyed it. Um, and something that I liked a lot about this was that multiple people are stuck in the time loop. And I think most of the time when you see that somebody's trapped in the time loop alone and trying to figure out how to get out of it alone. And so you don't see, I think this story very often where there are people working together or against each other or, you know, just even stuck in it, uh, um, together. So I thought that that was an interesting take on it and I ended up really liking it. And I, uh, this one was on my nomination ballot. And um, I wanted to mention that there was an episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. that I also nominated um, for short form. That was a time loop episode that I thought um, really did it very, very well. And if anybody saw that um, in particular, I thought like the choreography of the time loop of like trying to prove to everybody that they were trapped in a time loop by saying what they were going to say at the same time that just was a really well done episode so Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was something about 2020 that we got these (laughs) fresh takes on being stuck in the same day forever but I ended up really enjoying this movie and it will be high up on my ballot nice all right any final thoughts on this one or we want to move on okay Let's go ahead and move on to Soul. Uh, and Nana, I think you have the recapping duties on that one. Alrighty. So Soul is a 2020 um, animated film from Pixar. Um, it, it was a huge success. Um, one that year's um, animated feature, beating out um, another film that was acclaimed, Wolf Walkers, which was a fantasy, um, a small fantasy film. Um, regarding Soul, <clears throat> So it's about um, Joe, who's a middle school music teacher who has bigger aspirations of being like a 
jazz performer. One day, um, he actually manages to get a job performing in the jazz singer's band. And so he gets really excited about it. But then he dies by falling to a sewer. <laughs> and then realizes that he's wound up in the afterlife. And so Joe sets off to basically escape death. And he crosses paths with this wayward soul named 22. It was a, uh, um, in the theology of soul in the movie, um, um, souls are trained on how to become humans and they get, and when they head to earth, they get reborn into bodies of, in, of newborns and they grow up as like regular humans. But 22 is a soul that doesn't want to become alive basically. And so that's the huge, that creates a conflict between Joe and 22, where Joe wants to be alive and 22 doesn't. And so Joe breaks out of the afterlife and heads back to Earth, but like 22 ends up accidentally tagging along. And this is a long extended sequence where uh, 22 is in Joe's body and Joe's stuck in the body of his cat. <laughs> that's a really long part of the movie for some reason. And uh, uh, J in Joe's body, 22 starts to realize that actually life is kind of cool, but um, Joe becomes kind of jealous um, about this. And he's like, I'm trying to walk 22 through becoming his, taking his life. Um, they wind up back in the afterlife, but um, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Been... Um, Ed. Do you want me to keep going? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you don't, we don't have to recap the whole plot, but you can just talk about what you thought of the movie. Okay. Yeah. So when I saw Soul, um, it was acclaimed, but it was also, um, well, like black viewers, it was sort of um, controversial. There were those who thought it was an um, excellent representation. We got a bunch of varied uh, um, peop uh, images that we hadn't really seen before in a mainstream animated film, and so got a lot of acclaim for that. But there are also people who were um, complaining that so was just another one of an animated movie that introduced uh, a black character as a, as a protagonist, but then spent um, most of its runtime putting that black protagonist in like a, another body. Mm -hmm. with him for most of the time like princess and the frog that was a huge one and um that will smith movie spies in disguise if anyone remembers that where he's <laughs> a virgin that was a another one um actually um personally didn't have a problem with that because like again soul had a bunch of like black characters on on the edges and in the screen during the screen time so like the central plot um um that aspect of the film was an issue. What actually sort of kept me at arm's length from the film was Joe's kind of a jerk for a lot of it. Like that part where I was struggling to like recap where he heads back to the afterlife and he and 22 have this big falling out. I thought, what's with this guy? Yeah. You understand his, how as an adult, um, he's sort of feeling listless about like where he's ended up in life, but I kind of worried that the film kind of took it a little too far in that moment, where to the point where um, in the probably the film's most famous scene where Joe assembles all these small bits of his life, pieces in life, where he starts to play a tune and starts to remember like, uh, has like flashbacks of his life from childhood to present day, where he sort of become comes to an epiphany of what the meaning to life is mm -hmm. i find myself not being super invested in that moment even though it was basically like the emotional climax of the film yeah anybody else want to talk about soul well i guess nobody else is going to <laughs> um i almost forgot about this movie uh being on the list when i was i this was a i i'm not usually an animated movie guy because I work with kids with disabilities and a lot of times I've I will end up watching animated movies in bits and pieces a bazillion times mm -hmm. through my students and so I I 
would almost never have watched this movie except for I got interested because um, Ken Power uh, Kent Powers, who wrote it, is a Star Trek Discovery writer, or he wrote on one season of Star Trek. Mm. And so I was kind of like curious because of that. And my wife really likes jazz. So we watched Soul. And I think it's a very powerful film. Um, and I think the message of the don't sweat the small stuff, uh, which is a huge part of it, was really great and important. And uh, I think it has really great messages for kids. Um, and I thought that was all really, really, really good. And this is the one movie that came out during the pandemic that I was really sad didn't get a theatrical release because it definitely got lost in the shuffle because of the, the theatrical window being closed and which is too bad because it's, it's really, really impressive. And it's just amazing to think that the writer, it's the same writer as One Night in Miami, you know, the <laughs> Regina King movie, which was also really good. That was but, really good. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's two very, very different movies, and it's really interesting year that guy had. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Steve. I think for me, the big thing about this, uh, because I have kind of a background in psychology, is how it intersected with broad themes in personality testing. Mm. Um, so one of, the, one of the big things we're living in right now is this question about, like, what are we, right? So mm -hmm. the, the subheading for soul is, the story about you, mm -hmm. right? And um, and I think it takes me back to um, about a decade ago, Time Magazine, uh, their person of the year was you. Uh, <laughs> and 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 if you got into the subtext of what Time Time's decision to make you you <laughs> yes you the uh, the person of the year was largely the revolution in social media mm. and, and and internet connectivity. And so I think it's like super interesting how this like plays with that concept. Like it's actually like prime people um, with like this, this psychological typology. Um, and uh, there's a book by, uh, I want to say Sharon Zuboff, uh, who wrote a book called In the Age of Surveillance Capitalism. Mm -hmm. And and towards the, the, the culmination of that text and her kind of like theorization of how surveillance capitalism functions as a marketplace for the internet and, and intersects with social media. Uh, what she says is that fundamentally what they're trying to do is they're trying to score and rank people into personality types. And, 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 and then once they have people categorized, then applying predictive models to them and then longitudinally creating, like cre uh, shaping and driving to select for certain types of personality types, like and creating fit and for people and so on, right? Um, which is extremely dystopic, right? Um, and Zuboff saying this, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, <laughs> I th I'm sure that if you worked in the tech industry, you might have a criticism, but one of the big things is like this, like this, this typing for agreeability, um, which is kind of like this desirable, ultimately desirable attribute in the consumer society. Um, and so they're kind of borrowing a lot of that by like personality typing language, um, <laughs> even, even down to the fact, even down to like the, they have like that circular grid with all the dots, right? Um, and if you like, so if you Google like, if you Google like personality types, what you'll get is like, they talk about the, the five, the five mm -hmm. types and the array that they present for the five types is the, is, I mean, it's more, it's more dots in soul, but it's essentially the same like visual. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that like, that's really interesting how it talks about personality and when it talks about like the, the, na the nature of humanity and the nature <laughs> I mean, they're, they're presenting their idea on what the nature of humanity is and their, their idea on the nature of humanity is it is personality. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then add to this fact that I think I really liked it. I think it's very interesting, maybe a little bit dangerous, but I also have a huge soft spot for run afoul of divine bureaucracy, <laughs> like to, <laughs> you know, to be like a, to be like a California tech person and you're, and you're stumbling through and you inadvertently invent Taoism. <laughs> or a version of Taoism for the 21st century is wild to me. Um, so that was, it's very, it's very rich and very cool. Mm -hmm. And maybe a little bit scary. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Trish. Um, I thought it was very enjoyable, uh, really well executed. I'm a jazz fan myself. Um, and um, I liked the point about 
you know, at the beginning, everyone is invested in finding their spark or their, their individual spark and their purpose for living. And uh, it turns out that that's kind of focusing on the wrong things maybe for a lot of people. And mm -hmm. like you have the example of the barber who says he wanted to be a veterinarian, but barber school was cheaper and he ended up loving his life as a barber. So mm -hmm. I think those points are interesting. Um, but uh, uh, as a science fiction and fantasy movie, it didn't have a lot that surprised me. So, um, you know, it, it was fine, but it's not at the top of my list. What about you, Juan? Well, I was kind of surprised. I mean, actually, I didn't know what, I just knew that it was, you know, a movie about souls and stuff. I really didn't know what was going to go on. I did like the world building. I mean, the afterlife has a consistency, and I think that's what you always try to look for in a in a fantasy film that everything seems to be makes sense on how you know how the souls work um I, i'll be honest i have a best friend who has several cats in her house so the <laughs> cat the whole cat sequence was was fun um i i, I think it was a heartwarming film I, I think it's about you know people trying to find their place um in the world and you know how you have to work at it uh, and I think it's a character journey. I think uh, I think our protagonist is better person at the end than he was at the beginning. So I think I think it was worth uh, worth it. Um, I think it deserved its Oscar. Although I've always find the uh, the only problem I have with the animated Academy Award Oscar is that unfortunately they miss a lot of good stuff that's come that's coming in from Japan. And mm -hmm. the thing is. Just as a side note, uh, in the anime community, we're living in the golden age because now we are now seeing films more or less or at least a few months behind in the theater after Japan released it. Hmm. Yeah, I guess for, for me with animated films, I tend to favor the ones that aren't doing typical CG 3D animation stuff, which is why I like I liked Wolf Walkers a lot more than Soul, just because I liked that that kind of 2D animation style that it had. I thought it was was really interesting and I liked the story as well. Um, here, the one thing I did like in Soul was I liked the the fact that it wasn't just about the afterlife, right? There was also the before. Um, and I liked uh, the the other characters that were there that were kind of the, I don't know, shepherds of all the little souls and their weird uh, Salvador Dali <laughs> or Picasso looking uh, bodies. I thought that, that was cool to mix up the animation style there a little bit. And, and for someone like me who likes the traditional animation better i like it when it's mixed up a little bit so in terms of the style i enjoyed that any other comments on soul seth just <clears throat> just um yeah just just moving on c carrying on from that i think um i thought it was i'll use the word interesting i thought it was interesting the uh, uh as much as the personality and psychology certainly is a piece of it but also sort of the metaphysical and and spiritual kind of questions, at least on the side that the movie is, you know, movies playing with a little bit, which which um, uh, which I think is very interesting. And I haven't, I don't know that I've thought much about it since I watched the movie months and months ago. But uh, that comes back to mind as we talk about it today. So I, I mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, I just I just thought that was interesting, and especially in a film that uh, you know, uh, while not only a children's film, certainly will be seen by a lot of children. So raising those kind of um, maybe questions or conversations. Yeah. All right, should we move on? Uh, next, we have The Old Guard, which we've got Steve, who uh, was the default recapper because he said he'd take anything and no one else claimed it. <laughs> hey, so it's very simple. Uh, we are dealing with a group of people who, the Old Guard, titular Old Guard, are a group of people who basically can't die or seemingly can't die. Uh, their bodies recover. They're a family of wolverines. And I don't mean the animal, I mean the, <laughs> the superhero. Uh, they just have incredible regenerative powers. And they are Andy, Joe, Nick, uh, Brook, Booker, Booker, and uh, they're joined. And then there's, of course, a new, well, I'll call them immortals. It's not really immortals, but a new immortal who is uh, Neil Freeman, a Corporal Freeman. Uh, ostensibly, yes, we find the, the immortals going around and they're, as a, they're basically mercenaries leveraging their preternatural talent for getting shot a million times and getting back up. Uh, to 
basically be mercenaries in the world, but also like trying to fight for good, which is a deeply problematic idea. I'm sure we'll unpack. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so they, they, they get, they, they take a job from a ex CIA officer named Copley. Uh, they find out it's a setup that there's really a pharmaceutical company trying to get the hands on. They're trying to isolate biologically what gives them their regenerative powers. Similarly, they also have to bring, you know, initiate Neil into their, is it Neil or Nile? Neil, right? I think she said Nile in the movie. Nile? Is but... it Nile? Okay. That, that would actually make more sense. Um, sorry, Nile. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of dyslexic. Um, you know, they made Nile uh, bringing her into the family. Uh, this, is, of course, as she comes in, is also the same time that Andy, the eldest living uh, immortal, uh, is losing her regenerative powers. She, mm-hmm. She's getting hurt and she's staying hurt. Um, anyway, so they have a big showdown with Steve Merrick, the, the, the tech bro pharmaceutical guy, which I thought is funny because pharmaceutical guys tend to be either like, old as the hill scientists or like straight up frat bros mm-hmm. uh, as we've seen <laughs> but that was that was fun um and they yeah they 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 run around with nine millimeter carbines and shoot a lot of people and get shot a lot of times mm-hmm. and it's and it's fun highlander stuff um <laughs> Pretty much. we find out that like so andromeda is like uh is i think alluded to being andromache mm-hmm. from like the the iliad <laughs> the wife of hector going back mm-hmm. to troy and like the 12th the, the yeah the 11th i always forget how it works no the 12th century bce before the current era so she is old yeah <laughs> almost yeah more than three thousand years old mm-hmm. um so that's fun yeah i do want to say i did do uh, for my comment i'll say for me everything's kind of distilled into the conspiracy board at the end uh which is like that like you know copley has like been tracking them throughout history particularly mm-hmm. andromenake or andy um and so the so what what the, when they're doing the ti- when they're doing the title card they're like showing all the different events they were at and the events they list are the first I'm sorry the second and the sixth crusade the Napoleonic Wars Crimean War the Haitian Revolution in in reference to preventing something called the coup d'état which I I don't know the Haitian Revolution history well enough to be yeah I'm I'm more troubled by that but anyway they're in World War One World War Two. Um, particularly in the French Resistance and then in the Pacific Theater. Uh, they're, in the Democrat, they're in the Democratic Republic of Congo in the 60s. And um, they're, they're there at the Civil Rights Movement. <laughs> um, the Vietnamese Baby Lift, which is, again, a weird one. Weird one for them to be at because that's a weird... Anyway, we, we may not get into it. And also mm-hmm. Bosnia and Afghanistan. So um, Korea, conspicuously absent there uh they're almost always on the side of the english of the anglo powers so britain Mm. or the united states um in those conflicts and supposedly they're always there like it shows them like pulling a baby out and it's like doctor cures blindness in children or something you know anyway right um and it speaks to the thing that like you can you can kill your way to a better world right um which is which is what what this movie like it it starts out being like, like ambivalent about and then it's like yes you can you can kill your way to a better world which I'm like a big piece guy over here. Don't agree. Right. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, David. Oh, I thought Juan was before me, but um, oh, sorry. I'll go then. And then Juan could go. Yeah. So the thing with Old Guard is that um, I think the most important thing is that the director, um, Gina um, Price Brythewood, um, yeah. She had been trying for years to try and get an action movie as a director. She directed a movie called The Basketball Diaries and because of Hollywood sexism, like wasn't being given the shot. And so uh, I was rooting for this movie from the very beginning because you know she fought so long and hard to get an action movie. And I think she did a great job um, with the limitations. It was a Netflix movie, even though it had big stars in it. Um, it was never going to be released in theaters. So there was some limitations to that in for, you know, but whatever, I think it's a fun movie. It's an aggressively okay movie to me. It's not awesome or amazing. It's just good and fine. But what I think it did was show that this director Blythewood, that Gina Price Blythewood um, has the chops. Let's give her something bigger um to do and so i i have an article coming out soon on tour.com where i'm going to argue that she should direct jarell of joy reed which is the feminist classic sword and sorcery stories by cl moore from the 30s 
And I think what she was doing with this movie was basically showcasing, hey, I'm here, I can do action. And I think if we get another Old Guard movie, we might get a little bit more oomph um, from her. And, uh, but I, I thought she did awesome um, with what she had. And so yeah. I appreciated that about Old Guard. I was very supportive of it online for that reason. And I think, um, yeah, give this one more work because, and one of the things that's cool too about Old Guard and, um, is that uh, the, the characters are diverse without being shoved in your face. Um, you know, that it's like just natural. It's just there. It's just a thing. And I think that's part of a, a woman's touch on a movie like this too. Mm. So yeah, that's all I got to say on that. Yeah. Go ahead, Juan. Uh, I think it should also be uh, noted that this is the other uh, nominee, which was adapted from a comic book. Uh, this is based on a comic written by Greg Rucka, um, who's done a lot of stuff for the big companies. And this is his own book. And also very rarely, uh, he got to also write the screenplay for this film. Uh, I think it was a good action adventure. I like I, I It's kind of interesting because I was just thinking about this now. I mean, the one of the issues when dealing with immortal characters uh, do they get tired of it what do they do and i think the interesting thing is in the mil- film is the fact that they now realize there's a limit to their immortality that might give them hope of release in the future um all the characters are well developed the only thing i didn't like about the film is something at the end where uh they have an ally and just and to me and i, I apologize for the sake of being ba- to show that they're badasses they have to say well we'll kill you if you betray us which You've established a good relationship. You know, why do you have to say that? I mean, that's <laughs> that's over the top. It's not necessary. That was distracting to me. And it, and it you know, it was just a minor thing, but it, it just made me think of the movie. But excellent film. Yeah. Go ahead, Laurie. I think I agree with David's assessment that the movie is aggressively okay. I thought it was fun. I thought it was fine. Um, I didn't love it, but I, you know, I paid attention to it. And by the end of it, I liked it. But I would say like about the first 45 minutes, I was like, what are we doing, guys? I, it felt to me like um, kind of a monster of the week episode of Buffy for about the first 45 minutes. And then once we really got into, you know, they got into the lab and two of their party had been kidnapped and the betrayal, then I thought it was almost like a different movie at that point. And and I did really enjoy it from then on. And I think Charlize Theron is a great um, action star. You know, I've seen her beat up a lot of people and that, you know, she's always fun. I think she's a great physical actress. And I think she does a lot of those scenes herself. So that's just, it's it's fun to see her. Um, and then, yeah, the, we got to the end and I felt like we the end sort of brought it back to the kind of corny Buffy episode a little bit, like the... Um, the board that he had where he had been tracking them through time. I, I mean, I was just kind of giggling at that. And I was like, is this a, a newspaper clipping from the crusades that you have? <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> it's kind of funny to me. Um, but it did remind me of that um, theory that Nicholas Cage is hundreds of years old because there's that photo of the guy who looks like him from like the U S civil war. I think, does anybody know what I'm talking about? There's that picture of Nicholas Cage from like the 1800s. <laughs> so <laughs> that was kind of fun, but yeah, I thought it sort of, Started I out kind want of corny. to believe that <laughs> you can, you can do whatever you want. And then it kind of came back around to a little corny. Um, I didn't love in the beginning when uh, Charlie's basically kidnapped Niall and then shot her. And I, right. you know, I just feel like you didn't need to do that. You have literally all the time in the world. So you could have tried talking to her. Shooting her could have been a last resort. You could have shot her in the leg and it would have healed quickly. You know, it was just, I thought it was a little bit over the top um, and a little problematic, but you know, o- overall, I thought this was like a, a pretty fun watch. Um, but it'll be more toward the middle of my ballot, I think. Right. Yeah, there was no reason to get blood, blood and brains in her hair. You know, you could have. I mean. Yeah, leg shot would have worked. Uh, one thing I thought in this one was that you know uh, Dudley Dursley is playing the big pharma jerk ass uh, in here, and his name is Merrick, which is literally two letters off from Merck, um, which I thought was pretty on the nose, but it's straight out of the graphic novel as well. So yeah, Trish, go ahead. Uh, I, I agree that it was fun if you turn your brain off. Um, 
the uh, one point of the diversity thing that um, they did kind of hit you in the face with was when uh, soldiers were making fun of the uh, two male lover uh, uh, immortals and they were like, dude, <laughs> we're gonna go on living our fabulous life and you'll be dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that moment was kind of fun. Um, uh, but um, overall, it's just kind of depressing to think of these immortals who the best thing they can think of to do with their lives is be uh, mercenaries, you know, not even trying for power to change the world, but, you know, even though it shows up later that they were saving some people's lives who will then go on to do great things, but it's just, I mean, it's sad. Even uh, the Highlander TV show, you, you saw many, many different ways of life that people could choose to, you mm -hmm. know, do interesting things with their immortal lives. And even Mythos, who had been around forever and got bored with everything, at least he was doing research or something. And right. so this, uh, it was kind of unfulfilling that they all were so very uninspired with their lives. Well, I guess I'll just be a mercenary forever. Yeah. The one interesting thing here is the the idea that it's much more difficult to stay inconspicuous as an immortal mm -hmm. in the surveillance age, right? In the right. internet age. Um, but then you would think that would lead them to do things that were not so traceable and not, mm -hmm. not so loud and noticeable. So yep. um, Juan, why don't you go ahead? Oh, no, I just wanted to address something that Lori said about being two different movies i think that just shows you unfortunately was for better or for worse it was adapted from a comic and i think yeah probably literally adapted and i think that you made it sound like okay we've covered the first two issues which is setting up the problem and then oh here's the third issue with the twist of it's going somewhere that you didn't think it was going um and i haven't read the comic i just you know no i think the thing is when this came out i think greg got interviewed by kevin smith and mark bernardi on the fat man beyond podcast to talk about hey my movie's out and it's based on a comic and i got to write my own movie which you know again is a very uh very rare thing i mean off the top of my head the only time i happened it recently was um the woman who wrote gone girl glennis flynn got to write the screenplay adaption of her own book and so that's again very unique mm -hmm. in hollywood unless i'm wrong about that but you can correct me um no i just wanted to note that i mean follow we should have been a little bit more careful with that and maybe tried to make a more smoother transition so it wouldn't, you know, the seams didn't show, um, as, as Lori pointed out. Yeah, I will say I read the graphic novel this week. And so um, it's it's a very straight adaptation of that, of the first uh, volume uh, called Opening Fire, I think. There is There are a couple of changes, um, but Greg Rucka evidently insisted in the screenplay. He's like, I want, I, I want to have the speech where... Um, it's not Nick, it's the other guy, I can't remember his name, um, reacting to the, what is he, your boyfriend thing. He wanted to keep all of that in. So that's all straight out of the comic. And it's very sweet, actually. One more thing I want to add, and I just, I, I just forgot, there is more material. I mean, I was just looking at the, there are more, there are more series. So, and hopefully if this does well, we don't know what the, the Netflix magic is to determine whether you get more of something. Uh, we could get more material of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's just what I was going to ask. I, I was reading last night. I think someone said there could be a trilogy. I, I don't know. But of course, uh, Juan, as you said, uh, it all depends on Netflix magic numbers that they won't tell us about. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they'll tell us. We just don't know how much we should trust them. True enough. Yeah. Go ahead, Marshall. We'll say Hollywood has been hiring the, no the novelists and creators to write movies for a long time that's 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 a thing that's i mean like the exorcist william peter blatty adapted that for example as far back as that so i do think that happens from time to time yeah. and he made uh, exorcist 3 which is better than the exorcist so, <laughs> hot take oh, and peter benchley uh, wrote the the first treatment for jaws too so yeah it's been, it's been a thing i think it's cool that greg rock i got to do this and yeah, and I just I, said it was. Dude, I just said I it was rare. That, yeah. yeah, yeah, I here and there, yeah. Sorry, uh, not to. I would. I would say. I. I would say that I. I did hear that Old Guard did pretty well because it was early in the pandemic, and there was a lot of online chatter. So at the time, I remember hearing that they were 
developing the sequel and i don't remember i last i heard that um brythewood wasn't gonna come back as director but as a Mm. producer um because i think she's trying to position herself for something else yeah so i do remember that all right marshall you've been trying to to break in go ahead yeah, I mean, not not to harp on it for too long, uh, but just the idea of um, immortals fighting on the side of uh, Europeans throughout history being a force for good. Um, right. It, it's uh, to me, it's super problematic. Uh, like f- fighting wars and and killing, uh, you know, dark skinned people, it doesn't mean that you're a good person, uh, right? Or, or that you're you're a force for progress in the world. Uh, so that was, I don't know, kind of problematic to me. Um, or super problematic to me. Uh, there's there's a lot of other sort of injustice that they could be fighting as immortals throughout history, uh, and and ways about going going about it rather than just being like, oh, I'm just a soldier in a war. Um, but right. don't worry, I'm like I'm one of the good ones hiding in here doing uh, subversive acts uh, that justify my killing of people. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Trish. Trish? They could be doctors and nurses who would never get sick from the patients they were helping. There, there are many things that they could do that don't involve getting involved in other people's wars. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. That, that actually reminds me of, did anyone ever see the show Forever Night? It's a Canadian vampire yes. show. <laughs> uh, there's an episode of that where uh, there is a doctor like in the Black Death or something who notices that that uh, Lacroix and and Nicholas are are just walking around with impunity and and asks what their secret is and they're like well we can make you a vampire um, and uh, Nicholas thinks this is yeah, I can make you a vampire so you can keep doing your doctor work and do do wonderful philanthropic things and then of course he he turns him and then he just gets the bloodlust and is like oh none of that matters anymore because I'm immortal now. Dude, Seth, you just dropped Forever Night knowledge. That's yeah. that's pretty deep. Uh, pretty deep. Yeah, Highlander and Forever yes. Night, man. I always wanted yes. a crossover between those two shows. <laughs> there, there was a great thread. Yeah, Marshall that, brought up I a mean, good point, though, on Old Guard. Marshall brought up a very good point. I mean, yeah. it is it is a little icky. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if the comics are better on that or not, Seth, but did you see no, anything? That... No, it's a pretty straight uh, adaptation there. I mean, at least at least they were on the union side of the Civil War, which right. you can't be sure of with comic books. Yeah, uh, lost causeism is uh, regrettably is far too prevalent. But. Yeah. Well, at at the same time, that was a question I was going to bring up because I thought when we're looking back at their past, I don't remember them being in colon. At least I don't remember them being in at least what I thought was overt colonial wars. I mean, they weren't killing the Aztecs or something, but it, I could have missed that. I thought yeah. they were at least. And wars where it was at least somewhat they were fighting against an oppressor. I mean, you can question World War One, I, I guess, in, in, in that case about. Um, nope. Yeah. They but, were in the Crusades. Which side were they fighting on in the Crusades? They were on both in the Crusades. Yeah. One of them. <laughs> really? One of them was with the, I guess, for lack of a better word, jihad. So uh, I, I honestly thought that it, they were trying or at least. When I saw the film, they were implying that they at least tried to be on good causes and at least not trying to oppress people. But I could have been wrong and I could have missed something in when they were going over their career. That still accepts the thesis, though, that fighting on the side in a war can promote a good cause. Right. Uh, and, and I reject that like wholeheartedly. Fighting a war doesn't promote a good cause. Fighting a war promotes, you know, uh, people who were completely not involved in the decision making or the power structure uh, dying often through very terrible means of like famine or, you know, disease that runs rampant, uh, poisoned water, these sorts of things. People who had no choice whatsoever uh, get murdered for a good cause. Yeah. Go ahead, Steve. I think so going back to the conspiracy board at the end, for me, a lot of this rests on the inclusion a very, very small thing. There's one frame in there where it's like Operation Baby Lift, 1975. Um, So which is like a very opaque (laughs) reference. But, you know, uh, so and it's like but it it makes for a good picture because you have like, you know, people holding babies 
and then like Charlize Theron carrying a child in the background. Uh, Operation Baby Lift was ostensibly the effort of the U.S. to, you can argue if this is, I, I'm going to say, for lack of a better word, kidnap 300 Vietnamese babies out of Saigon at the orphan, orphan children at the end of the war. Um, you know, you, we can have an, people could have an argument. I don't want to have that. But uh, what happened was the plane was taking off and it, 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 the back end of it exploded. Mm. There's ambiguity as to why that happened, if it, you know, um, and they had to do a force emergency landing in a rice paddy south of Saigon. And like, you know, uh, 136 people died, many of them infants. Uh, and, and it's just an unbelievably mm. senseless and horrifically tragic event mm -hmm. that makes for like a really nice picture. <laughs> right. But that that was like so sent like and so so like you know again to the uncritical viewer who just like oh apparently in the past they did a good thing helping some kids, um, right. But but if you know the historical context, it's deeply upsetting, and that's my problem with with old guard, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, and here you know in in the movie you have them fighting against big pharma, essentially personified by D Dudley Dursley, and you know the notion that. That 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 Merrick character would be just completely fine with you know slicing and dicing on these immortals until he finds the secret and then he can of course sell it to the highest bidder not to help humanity but to help his shareholders. So that that gives them a a, a just cause to fight against. Okay, anything else to say on this one, or we can we can move on to the last one on the list, which I know we've all been just waiting for, champing at the bit. Okay, uh, oh, Eurovision. Oh God, here we go. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> Eurovision Song Contest: The Story of Fire Saga. Now, Olav on uh, on Twitter or on on DM with me um, said that evidently Sean and McGuire really enjoyed the movie and marshaled her fans to uh, nominate this movie. Which, I guess, you know, if you have uh, influence, you can use it to do things, and this is a thing that you could do. Um, she would perform at a ceremony with a couple of her friends, including. Catherine Valentine, I think, which I think is really suspect, but um, I'll, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, who did we have for a recap on this? I know, I know, we had Josh, but uh, I got uh, Lori's TED talk yesterday over direct message on Twitter. <laughs> so, so Josh, why don't you go ahead and kick it off, and then we'll we'll just uh, let uh, Lori vent her spleen for a while. Can we just have a collective boo? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, well, yeah. Speaking of problematic Europeans, no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, so Eurovision is, uh, uh, the best way to describe it is a Will Ferrell movie. Yep. I'm done. No, uh, it's, it's a Will Ferrell movie uh, that is also a Adam Sandler movie from the 90s at the same time. Uh, it, 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 uh, it, it, it follows the exact same progression, I think, as Happy Gilmore. Um, mm. uh, you have Will Ferrell's man child, this time who's Icelandic, uh, teamed up with Rachel McAdams. They are childhood friends who are motivated by the Eurovision singing contest. Will Farrell's great dream in life is to win the contest. Through a series of events, they end up participating in the Eurovision contest. They meet a bunch of really exciting European and eccentric Europeans. Uh, they face some struggles, um, and then they come out victorious in their own way. And also, there are elves, kind of. Which is the <laughs> right. only possible reason I can imagine why this could be nominated for a, a Hugo Award. Yeah. Um, I have thoughts about it, but I'll defer to others before I share them. So, yeah. I, I should also note there are ghosts in it. Oh, ghosts. right. That's oh, true. yes, that's right. I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. There are ghosts too. My apologies. Ghosts and elves. But that right. takes about five minutes of two hours of runtime. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's well, the thing. The presence in the film is like super tenuous at best. Like, mm -hmm. it feels like a convenient. Oh, it's a, it's a fantasy film. Yeah, it has trolls that are that you don't even see on screen. And Demi Lovato is a ghost. Like, come on. Right. For me, it's obviously fantasy that someone as beautiful and charming and talented as the Rachel McAdams character could fall for <laughs> someone like Will Ferrell. <laughs> That's true. Go ahead, Lori. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so 
First, um, I will say Kevin and I were talking about this this morning. Kevin is um, going to rank this below no award on his ballot because he said it, it it is not science fiction or sufficiently fantasy. But one thing that he said that might be science fiction is the uh, aspect of time in this movie. We could not figure out when it was, when things were happening based on when ABBA would have been performing in Eurovision and the fact that um, in real life, Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams are uh, 12 years apart in age, but are yeah. supposed to roughly be the same age in the movie. Um, so that was super confusing to me at first. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just refer back to this, uh, how I was basically live tweeting you my thoughts about this uh, movie mm -hmm. last night. So if you wanna fix yourself a cup of tea, now would be a good time because you, you've already heard all of this. <laughs> um, but yeah, Josh, thank you for leading with the man child because it's like, that's a Will Ferrell movie, right? And right. and it's it's so lazy. And the thing that it made me think of was, um, if anybody's familiar with the writer Ijoma Aluo, she published a book this year called Mediocre. And um, I have not read it, but I do want to read you kind of just like the subtitle of it, which will tell you basically what it's about. And I, I enjoy following her on social media. Um, it's called Mediocre, The Dangerous Legacy of White Male America. And there's a sentence from the um, summary on Amazon that I think is helpful. And it basically says, what happens to a country that tells generation after generation of white men that they deserve power? What happens when success is defined by status over women and people of color instead of by actual accomplishments? Mm. And that's what I thought of when I watched this movie, because I thought, Will Ferrell, he just shows up and acts like a big baby and rakes in money and you know makes get gets more jobs. And the thing is like, I don't think that Will Ferrell is incapable of being funny. I think that um, I like him in the movie Stranger Than Fiction. Hmm. I like him in Elf, you know, and his character in Elf I think works because he's like a fish out of water. It makes sense that he doesn't understand how the world works. It makes sense that he doesn't know what a taxi is or know about gum stuck on the you know, rail in the subway. I mean, those things make sense because he didn't grow up in that world. But when he's like a character like that in a movie that, you know, is otherwise not supernatural, elves notwithstanding, ghosts notwithstanding, it just doesn't work for me. Um, you know, there's a scene at the end where he's on the boat and he's a fisherman's son and he's running around looking for the exit to the boat. And I just was like, you know, humor can be over the top. You can, in a, in a movie set in the real world like this, you know, you can push things a little bit and that's funny. But this was just like him acting like a silly fool for two hours. And so I, I couldn't get behind it. And then, so then it, by contrast, Rachel McAdams is 12 years younger than him. She's beautiful. I did appreciate, you know, I, I will say some things that I liked about it. Rachel McAdams is 42 years old and she is absolutely beautiful. She also looks like a grown woman. You know, they haven't tried to make her face smooth like porcelain as often happens in movies you know you sometimes see some wrinkles you see the shape of her face as a grown woman's face and I, I was as a person who uh is almost her age and my skin does not look as good as hers but <laughs> still I was like glad to see a 42 year old woman not being made to look like she was 20 opposite Will Ferrell at 54. Um but yeah so those things bothered me because I thought he just gets to show up oh she also she trained for her Icelandic accent. She practiced, she listened, she rehearsed. She also sang every song. Now they used a, um, a Swedish pop star to perform her songs and they did some kind of overlay of them, but she actually learned and sang those songs. Yeah. Now Will Ferrell, you know, clearly he, he can carry a tune, but he's not a great singer. So he got to show up and look like his regular self, act like a doofus, Really, really, Kevin said this morning, like, were there even any jokes in that movie? I mean, not really. It was basically him just like wandering around, not understanding how the world works. Oh, no, there was uh, the hilarious part where he was stuffing the cod piece to make it, you know, to make an impression, right? That, that oh, was, my God. That's what yeah, passes just, for humor. Yeah, right. So it's just like he got to be so deeply mediocre in this movie where you could tell that other people had tried. There had, you know, she had she had really tried to do well with what they had. Um, and so it brought me back to the thing that I've thought about Will Ferrell for a long time, more like, is he funny or is he just loud? Right. <laughs> and then I had, I had a problem with the end where he makes this grand, what, what we're supposed to see, I think, is a grand romantic gesture by letting her sing her original, letting her sing her original song at Eurovision. And she says, but we'll be disqualified. And he's like, doesn't matter, you love it. And I just thought, maybe she didn't want to be disqualified from Eurovision. <laughs> 
she, she made it all the way to Eurovision to the finals. Maybe she didn't want to be disqualified. And I just wanted her to, I just wanted her to get laid. I wanted that so much for her. I wanted her to get with Dan, Dan Stevens. Um, another quibble I had was she catches uh, Dan Stevens making eyes at um, Nadja from What We Do in the Shadows, who was a delight. The 60 seconds she was in that movie was, were the best 60 seconds, but making, making eyes at her brother. And she says, are you gay? Which is a very strange time to ask him, by the way. And he says, no. And then she goes on to say, gender fluid, non-binary. And I thought neither one of those have anything to do with whether or not he might be into this guy. So <laughs> just from start to finish, I was confused. And I thought this movie was, I didn't like it. Yeah. My, so I had basically a good time watching it. It was stupid. Uh, it was juvenile. I did like some of the songs. I loved the fact that, yeah, Rachel McAdams looked like she was actually singing. And the, and what you said, Lori, makes sense there because there's like really good movies like uh, last year, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, really good movie, terrible performance of pretending to sing by Viola Davis, which is, which is awful because it just took me right out of the movie. Um, but here, you know, I enjoyed the music. I thought Dan Stevens was very funny. Um, but like the movie would be, a hundred percent better with literally anybody but Will Ferrell in it. I mean, put Christopher Plummer in there and it's a better movie. This so. is a huge tangent, but I'm um, speaking of dance. Whoa, Stewart. that's weird casting. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's who you put in for problematic people. So speaking sorry, go ahead, Nana. He has a German film out um, this year called I'm Your Man, where he plays a android. Um, so if anyone's like interested in that, you might want to check it out. Uh, Dan Stevens, I think he's a very good actor. He was also in Legion. It didn't mm -hmm. really get much like Hugo in terms of Hugo votes, but that was like a really interesting offbeat X-Men show. I yeah. say X-Men show, but it wasn't really super connected to the larger X-Men mythos. Yeah. Go ahead, Juan. Oh, okay. Off mic. Um yeah, Will Ferrell. Unless he's directed by Kevin Smith, I'm, I I I just can't. Um, I and I wanted to like this movie. I thought it had. An, I think it they just done th this underdog, these underdogs trying to make it to 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 Eurovision and winning. You know that would have been great. But the man and the man child. I for, perfect word you know, by both of you would be man child acts. You know when he leaves or in a lurch it's really annoying and that's only to put you know a little bit more conflict for him to get you know to the final thing i didn't even think about what laurie said about maybe she doesn't want to be disqualified it goes because you're thinking oh he's doing this for love and i go oh my god laurie's right you know he, she's sabotaging this could be this could be it uh i did like the sing-along moment that they have when all the contestants are just chilling out and just doing a sing-along i think i think that was the best part of the movie um I'm also might have been a little bit more favorable to this movie because I was a big fan of Space Opera by Catherine M. Valenti, and maybe that's what, one of the reasons why Shannon was for it. Um, but yeah, Will 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 Ferrell. Uh, I I still haven't seen Elf. I don't ever plan to see Elf. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I think it is banned from my house on Christmas. So <laughs> uh, let's just leave it at that. Elf is fun. I will say. And Stranger Than Fiction is a really good recommendation, actually. That's a very good movie. And it, it doesn't rely on Will Ferrell's comedy, you know, com uh, comedic energy. So it's more of a drama. Go ahead, David. Well, um, I didn't know about the fan, about Sean Ann McGuire's uh, manipulation of the voting, <laughs> um, as it were. Um, so the whole time I was watching it, I kept thinking... Why wasn't Bill and Ted face the music right. in this position? Because that was an incredible sci-fi comedy with heart that got me in all the feels and had music and had the whole thing. And I, there were moments that I was crying, laughing during that. And I just kept thinking of that movie during Eurovision because yeah. Eurovision is two hours and three minutes. There probably is an hour and 20 minute cut that wouldn't have been quite so terrible. Hmm. Um, I will say the one time I laughed was the opening scene when they're playing in the fjord with the potato man song. I thought that was funny. 
<laughs> and then I was like, if you did, if you did a whole movie of them having like some crazy fire saga vision, you know, like that, maybe I would have been more amused by that. Yeah. Because that's the only time I really laughed out loud. And, and there I was like, okay, maybe this won't be so bad, but why is it two hours and three minutes? But overall, I don't want to completely dunk on it as far as, you know, I think Will Ferrell is great in short form comedy. He was great on SNL. He definitely is a smart comedian. Mm -hmm. He's a better, he's produced really intelligent movies as a producer, right? So I know he can do better, but the funny yeah. thing is, is he's wanted to make a Eurovision movie since 1999, I read. Mm. And, um, you know, he worked on it this long and this is what he came up with. It's like, I don't know. It's very, very bad. I will say I didn't know anything about the Eurovision competition. Really, I knew, knew that it existed, that it was a thing, but I never watched any of it. And the best thing I got out of watching this movie was going to YouTube and watching the 10 yes. most WTF moments from Eurovision <laughs> after the movie was over was right. way more entertaining than this actual movie. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, um, it shouldn't be here. Bill and Ted face the music, I think way more uh deserving type of movie like this yeah so yeah, yeah i will Epic say sax guy yes anybody who hasn't actually googled what the actual eurovision song contest looks like the movie does not take a ton of liberties with how bonkers it is so um yeah worth looking up the like you said david the most wtf moments go ahead josh yeah, so I um, I did the same thing. I uh, you can actually on YouTube watch. There's a video. I don't know how long it is. Twenty minutes, half an hour, of clips of all of the winners of Eurovision, video and audio of them back yep. to the beginning, and uh, it was an education for me. Uh, and I think it is true in the I think in that sing along scene, a few of the winners who I could identify, or at least participants who I could identify, are in that scene. Um, some mm -hmm. of them are have a particular look to them that you can kind of uh, make out in that scene. Um, you know, Seth, you mentioned, you know, the movie was fun enough when you watched it and it is kind of as a dumb movie, I think fun. I carry a lot of goodwill from Will Ferrell on SNL. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to have the best of Will Ferrell DVD and back in graduate school, my friends had to confiscate it from me because I was impersonating some of his characters too much. But literally they did. Um, but you know, Laurie, the comments you raised, I think aren't important and there was a moment when i watched it last night because i watched it again last night to kind of prep myself for this where they're leaning in to kiss he and um rachel mcadams and he's doing something weird with his lips some sort of you know stupid thing with his lips and she's just being normal and i'm thinking and in my head i'm like i don't think she thinks this is funny at all <laughs> like yeah. the actress maybe <laughs> like i'm just <laughs> imagining he's being real stupid and she's like can we have do we have to this kiss is weird enough and between the characters. Do we have to do this extra like weird lip thing? Yeah. And it just felt, it felt dumb, you know, like lazy, I think is the right word, Laurie, yeah. for that. Well, um, and Rachel McAdams is a terrific comic actress too. Mm -hmm. if, if nobody's, if people haven't seen Game Night, that is a terrific movie. Okay. The, the other thing I'd say, someone raised this in the chat, so I won't take, I forget who it was, take credit for this, but it, it did remind me, someone raised the question of what jokes there are in it. Someone raised the question of the, the scenes of the Americans which I actually think are can be pretty funny. Steve, I see your hand there. I think I think that was you. I think that was actually kind of funny where he just rants against the uh, the character rants against the Americans, which I thought was um I thought was funny. So, yeah. That's all I have there. Yep. Go ahead, Lori. I'm not against ranting against Americans. I just didn't think it was funny. <laughs> yeah, on the subject of ranting against Americans, uh, I I mean, I I wondered if they were trying to compensate or be, the movie was trying to be in conversation with itself for um be, ma you know making a caricature of the other cultures which I, I you know I was thinking about it and Kevin and I said to each other last night like I wonder what Icelandic people think about this movie and then I was thinking about you know our entitlement as uh Americans as, and, and then you know Rachel McAdams is Canadian and um Dan Stevens who I've almost called Dan Simmons 10 times not the same guy um, is British. So I wonder if it's like 
English speakers, white people, something, I don't know. But we just like are so comfortable putting on another culture and making a caricature of it with like yeah. our best like Musan squirrel accent, you know, just generic Boris and Natasha kind of accent. And I just mm-hmm. thought like this, this just feels very tired to me. This feels like a movie that I would have seen, you know, when I was in high school or when I was in college. And um, I just thought in like this day and age, this isn't funny to me and I want you to try a little harder. Um, but after my my lengthy rant, I did want to um, mention a few things that I liked about it. I did like the songs. I did like the costumes. I thought that um, Dan Stevens was really funny. I thought Rachel McAdams was pretty funny. And I am very interested to see actual Eurovision competitions because um, I, I just watched it yesterday. So I haven't had an opportunity to do a whole lot of um, YouTubing, but I definitely want to because it, it looks like a great time. Yeah. Well, and thank you, Seth. Because of you, I did a Eurovision tenant double feature, which is this super weird double feature. <laughs> that is what we did yesterday as well, the tenant Eurovision double feature. I feel the last 48 hours I've watched those too. So, yeah. <laughs> it's been like six months since I watched Eurovision. So, I, I feel okay with it. All right. Wait, uh, you watched this on your own? You watched Eurovision without? this motivation i i watched it as soon as i saw it was nominated for the hugo oh, okay yeah so okay i see i yeah. i will confess i watched it on my own i'm <laughs> just gonna admit that and then mute myself all right well, you admitted to being a will ferrell fan josh so yeah it's trouble yeah yeah and brothers is a good movie yeah. <laughs> well i you know i'm not saying that i was terribly upset i watched it because Like I said, I think the best thing was getting more knowledge or having an education on Eurovision as a thing. Yeah. And um, I I have a friend who recently moved to Iceland and um, I I had I've already sent her a message asking her if she's seen it and what if people from Iceland. I had the same thought, Lori. Um, But uh, I just because her perspective, too, of being an American who's moved there. She has lots of really funny and interesting opinions about Iceland. It'll be interesting to see what she has to say, but I'm sorry. She didn't write back yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we can kind of sum up at this point, we've covered all the movies, um, but I do want to give people a chance to shout out some other movies that made their nomination ballot or that they would have liked to have seen on the short list. So go ahead, Nana. Oh man, I'm ready. <laughs> so I'm just going to like, read off from my nomination list. Let me see if I could pull it up. Sure. There we go. So um, I think like, I don't know if we mentioned it yet, but The Vest of Night, that was a major one that people tried to push for. It got an eligibility extension because it um, premiered in theaters before the pandemic and Amazon released it to a wider audience during. Um, That was... um, a small little sci-fi film about a um, someone about a two people in a small town who are running a radio show, and uh, they end up weird, strange things starts happening. That's akin to like an old a sci-fi episode from an old '60s TV show, like Twilight Zone or The Outer Limits. Yeah, it was a really interesting uh, sort of slow-paced uh, small sci-fi to kind of. I don't want to say you don't really see it anymore, but you don't usually get and release the big avenues like Amazon Prime. So that mm-hmm. was really interesting. I wasn't that super into it, but I appreciate it. Um, also, um, Possessor, if anyone's heard of that, that was this uh, really grimy sci-fi horror film mm-hmm. about like a secret agent who like possesses people in order to commit um, assassinations. Really mm-hmm. interesting. Baku Rao, that was a film I really tried to push hard for. Um, it's this uh, weird near sci near future weird western film set in a small town in Brazil that realize that finds out that they've been taken off GPS and the map, and strange things starts happening to them. And eventually, um, without spoiling too much, they realize that they're um, under attack by Americans, and it basically turns into like an action film disguised as an art house film. I really wish more people were able to um, see that. Hmm. Um, 
I don't know how you how what everyone here feels about um television in the long form category like TV seasons and stuff. Um, last year I nominated um the four part um final arc of Star Wars the Clone Wars those mm. last four episodes which I thought were astounding probably like one of the best pieces of Star Wars that we got over the past yeah. decade even though we got a lot of Star Wars to the point where it became kind of exhausting but the Clone Wars fine finale I thought that was fantastic and yeah. book three of Infinity Train if anyone's heard of that that was that show on Cartoon Network and HBO Max it's about um this train that comes into the lives of various um, protagonists. It's like an anthology show with a connected plot where this train comes and basically kidnaps people. And, and throughout their adventures, it ends up as like a form of like therapy where they start to, where each protagonist starts to realize their own um, personal character flaws and starts, starts to overcome them. Book three was sort of a departure in which it followed um, characters that were already on the train and were rebelling against it. Um, I don't want to like say, speak too much about it because I really think it's a show that needs to be watched on its own. To, like, hmm. experience. Nice. Valid. Go ahead, Marshall. Um, uh, the, the one that I would uh, really recommend is uh, Lapsus, was uh, written and directed by Noah Hutton. Um, we, we did a podcast episode on it, so you can look that up, uh, and listen to our discussion of lapsus in depth, but, um, it's, uh, it's like the Amazon warehouse, but for walking. So it's a, it's a gig economy where they, a guy like just tows a cable through the wilderness to attach it from one end of a thing to another end of a thing. Um, but, uh, robots are, are being brought in to do the job more efficiently than humans, um, mm. And so it's just a, it's kind of a takedown on the gig economy uh, and is a, a really great class consciousness movie that um, I quite enjoyed. Hmm. The nice. big shout out to Lapsus, definitely. How about you, Juan? Oh, I got a few things. Prom Springs is the only thing that made it on my book. I recommend Sputnik, which is a horror film. It was an independent uh, horror film, Russian, that took place during the soviet era it's it's kind of like alien set in the present day but in the soviet union it, mm. it had some good scares in it uh i i'm with uh nana and i believe in nominating a whole season of a tv show i did nominate lovecraft country season one and i'm wondering if that's why it didn't show up on the ballot because people either nominated an individual episode or they did what i did um that is one thing that uh, Joe Straczynski in the 90s would tell people which episode we should nominate so we wouldn't split up the vote. And I, at least that's how I recall in the 90s what happened. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing I nominated was Crisis on Infinite Earths, which at least concluded in 2020. And I think that would have I thought that was an excellent adaptation of a classic 80s comic book story. Mm -hmm. And I'm also with Nana on the final arc of the Clone Wars, where we see from the point of view of uh, Ashoka T Tano. Uh, what was going on while, uh, you know, what was going on when we were, what was going on with her trying to liberate Mandalore while Anakin and Obi-Wan were doing what they were doing in the rise of Revenge of the Sith. Yeah. I'm just sort of tying to what Juan um, brought up in regards to um, people nominating a full seasons versus individual episodes. I think that's exactly what happened to Watchmen last year because Watchmen was going to make the final ballot on long form, but it, um, the, the two individual episodes got higher votes, so it ended up uh, falling off, and I think that's how Rise of Skywalker ended up being on the final ballot, which uh, but... Um, yeah, I can, I can defend Rise of Skywalker, but I can get that, and also, yeah, I mean, I did the same thing. I nominated Watchmen as a whole series for it, so I, you know, and I can understand, I, I've never worked Hugo Awards, but I can understand making that call and how difficult that call can be. Yeah. David, why don't you go ahead? Got a few recommendations. Uh, just for future record, if anyone wants to argue about Rise of Skywalker, I would love to crush that movie on a podcast anytime because <laughs> I, I hated it beyond passion and of 10 burning suns. But, um, and this from a big Star Wars fan who did love the Clone Wars and just, I just did not like Rise of Skywalker. I thought it was terrible but anyways 
I will agree with you one on Sputnik. Sputnik, I want to back. Uh, it was a great movie. Um, Cold War with uh, Cold War story with um, an excellent alien that actually looked like an alien. So um, yeah, Sputnik was really great. It's more of a horror movie. It, well, sci-fi horror movie, but um, yeah. And I had a, a Vast of Night was on my list. Um, Vast of Night, what I, I think is uh, so phenomenal about that movie is that the the one single shot that they do at the beginning of the movie with um, doing it in period on an indie budget is an absolute miracle. Mm. If you know anything about filmmaking and you see that first scene, that first scene is an absolute miracle. It's not even just that it's a good shot. It is a miracle. Mm. And I'm not saying, I, I know that word sounds like hyperbole, but it's incredible. Now, the rest of the story is, yeah, it's, but I liked it. I thought it was enjoyable. I want more smart sci-fi like that. So please, everyone spread the word, watch it, Vast of Night. Um, I agree with Nana on Possessor as well, um, which is the film by Brandon Cronenberg, second movie by Brandon Cronenberg, son of David Cronenberg. The apple does not fall, fall far from the body horror tree. Um, and what's awesome is I think that got, um, his dad back to making another weird sci-fi movie. Cause I think he just finished one, but possessor is great. It's super odd. It's super weird. It's like the lost David Cronenberg movie that y- you've always wanted to see. So I really loved that. Uh, I think Vivarium with, um, was Jesse Eisenberg. It, um, that was, and, um, uh Imogen Poots that was a super underrated movie it's super weird it's very Twilight Zoney um and it's I know it's not for everyone and there's parts in it that are intentionally irritating beyond belief so that has turned off a lot of people but um Mm -hmm. it's a really excellent um kind of statement on monotony of the suburbs and all kinds of different weird and interesting things it's a really smart and intelligent uh surreal sci-fi movie and then probably my top two this year was uh synchronic with anthony mack starring anthony mackie by um their two uh best friends from here in san diego um uh, moorhead and benson who just signed on to do Moon Knight, but they did a really great Lovecraftian horror movie called The Endless. And this is a time travel um, kind of murder mystery cop thing with, um, and yes, I'm a PKD guy. And yes, there's drugs that cause time travel in it. So of course it was right up my alley. Um, Time traveling drugs, um, totally my thing. But the absolute best movie of 2020, in my opinion, was The Platform from Spain, Mm. which you could watch on Netflix. It's a horror movie. It's surreal. It's a lot like Cube, but it's about classism and society. It's one of the smartest low budget movies I've ever seen. It's super brutal and painful to watch. If you watch it dubbed, it's okay, but you should watch it subtitled um and the platform just blew me away like every second of it i was just like i can't believe this got made i can't believe some crazy dude made this and i hope they i hope people back up truckloads of money to that guy to make smart intelligent anti-capitalist movies in the future so that's the platform Mm. and uh i think everyone should see that yeah always watch subtitled i agree um, but yeah, platform to me was, I couldn't believe that it wasn't higher on more people's lists. I, hmm. uh, I just thought it was incredible and it's on Netflix. David, just a quick question. Did you get to see Sputnik in a theater or did you see it online? No, I saw it online. Yeah. Um, I think the first movie back I saw, I was pretty late. I think the first movie back I saw was Black Widow. So and, and I'm back to seeing movies in the theater now, but um, but I, I was definitely taking the year to watch movies at home. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering, they showed uh, it at the Florida Film Festival as a midnight show, and I was able to talk a friend into it. Now, it's a dinner theater. We were all wearing our masks, and everybody's temperature was taken. I was just curious about that. 
Yeah, I wish I had seen it. I think it would be really cool too. And unfortunately, like for example, the platform is a movie that I think would work really well with an audience because I think there'd be lots of jaw dropping moments and people gasping and people being like, I should say the, the, the plot of the movie platform, it's a little convoluted and complicated, but what it is, is there's a guy, there's two guys, they, they're, they're on a platform that goes up and down and there's 200 levels basic basically the food starts at the top 200 levels and goes to the bottom and you move from the top to the bottom based on how you behave and there's one meal that starts at the top that's lavish like a buffet and as it goes down people get a few like a short period of time to eat and then it goes to the next level. And so the people at the bottom have to eat whatever's left from the people at the top, mm-hmm. right? So it's about classism and capitalism and it's, it's a giant metaphor and it's just a freaking brilliant movie. Like on every level, I just, I was at home watching that. My wife and I like literally like looked at each other and like clapped when it was over Hmm. like just us like wow yeah that was great and it was kind of out of nowhere and then a lot of talk happened after that but i but when we saw it i hadn't heard anything about it just Hmm. that was a horror movie the uh the one that i wanted to mention was the invisible man uh the lee one l movie with elizabeth moss it's tremendous uh it had a terrible trailer i remember watching the trailer and thinking that that looks like garbage but it's really really good and it looks fantastic for a movie that was shot on a seven million dollar budget so if people haven't seen that one i recommend it uh just incidentally we covered that one on take me to your reader recently so if you want to you know check out the classic the invisible man and the new one and hollow man as well from the two from 2000 you can find that i would like to ask Lori if she what she thinks of of considering like her field what she thought of an invisible man because i thought it i thought it did great stuff with domestic violence but i i'm yeah. not in the field i haven't seen it oh you should check it out so I'll need yeah because the whole movie yeah you should because the whole movie is about gaslighting and this yeah. woman who's not taken seriously so and fun thing though- i kind of don't like that in my media <laughs> like not that i don't think it has a place in the media but like right 40 plus hours a week is uh, for 11 years is enough for me. So sure, I yeah. oftentimes sort of uh, try to avoid that. Um, uh, although like people, you know, we'll talk about things like that and TV shows and movies and books. And I'm just like, I think I'm going to go watch a Marvel movie or yeah. something stupid like Eurovision. Oh, although <laughs> Lori, I'm, I'm curious. You didn't see the trailer for it because they, they heavily marketed that film. I think I saw it when it, a, uh, before I I, I saw a bunch of tra- I saw it a bunch of times when it was a trailer before the movie I was gonna see. Yeah. I probably did, and I probably just don't remember. I don't have a great memory for like seeing movie trailers. I don't pay a lot of attention to them, so I probably did see um, trailers for it. And I'm thinking like recently, one of the organizations that I work with posted like a lengthy review of either a movie or a TV show, and I wonder if it was that about the. Um, accurate portrayal of the relationship so maybe mm-hmm. it was that um but i i will look into watching it i'll consider watching it because it sounds interesting yeah i thought it was great yeah because thing- i think the whole idea of modernizing it the invisible man was creating i think lee winnell's pitch was you know to put it into a domestic violence situation yeah. where you know especially like and and you, i mean anybody who's been around and my wife also worked in that field for a while and you know that there's a lot of people who just refuse to believe the cops that take the side of the abusers and those kinds of things and i thought it was just a really smart way to do it and um lee winnell by the way too his movie before that upgrade is um super underrated yeah super good awesome yeah the the other thing that i had nominated was devs just the entire kind of limited season or series of that Um, yeah, I thought that was tremendous, so really interesting meditations on uh, metaphysical determinism. And um, yeah, really thought that was that was fascinating. Uh, Nana, you got your hand up. Yeah, um, I've been thinking about like, when we were talking about all these uh, smaller movies, like, with the way that uh, entertainment is now with all these different streaming services, like a lot of these uh, films, um, people probably um like i, I guarantee um, most hero voters um 
probably hadn't heard of a lot of these films by the time of voting and like, yeah a lot of the films that um got nominated were either whatever major releases could be major in the time of covid or films that are on like major streaming services like netflix or hulu or in the case of eurovision were heavily promoted in the fandom yeah. spaces. so i'm i guess my question in regards to like the dramatic presentation long category is it's sort of been a struggling with um a lot of the nominees being uh not necessarily blockbusters, but films of note where a lot of smaller films sort of fall under the radar. Um, yeah. I'm asking the panel of what do you think would be um, the best way to combat this? Mm. That's a good question. Anybody want to tackle that? Well, I, I can feel that. I mean, it, it, it comes and it goes. I mean, I think it's kind of interesting. There have been some really big upsets and in the category before it was split, like ET, Blade Runner, although it was a big movie, did upset E.T., which was the biggest movie in the world at the time. And The Princess Bride also came out, and that was also a low-budget movie. And I'm not saying that's... And I think in 2019, I think Olaf uh, from uh, the Hugo Book Club pointed out that half the films were cheap because you had The Quiet Place, uh, the um, the Boots Riley's films, I... I Darn, I'm blanking out on the title. And I think there was a, something else low budget. Sorry to bother you. Sorry to bother you was the oh, Boots Riley man. film. And that was an under, I think half the films were kind of under budget, which was kind of a surprise. And also half the films focused on people of color, which was also a pleasant surprise. So I, it, there, I don't know if there's a way if we, I, 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 I don't know if there's any way to encourage it. I mean, it's just word of mouth. I mean, it helps, obviously, if you have somebody with a big fan base. And I love Shauna McGuire. And I think, you know, she was trying to use her power for good for something that she really liked and cared for. Um, uh, oh, man, I, I want to dunk on that, though, because uh, I actually <laughs> I'll come back. I'll wait for my turn. But. No, no, I think I'm done. I don't know if I could say anything more about that. Go ahead, David. Oh, you're still on mute, bud. Oh, sorry. I will go ahead and dunk on that. Um, I don't, I, I could understand her using her following to promote a movie that was like lower budget or lost or had a good message. But if, if really, if this is about her wanting to do a performance of a Eurovision thing, or yeah, I just, I kind of think that that's, manipulating the category i think it's going against like the ideals of like having a fan vote for like excellent meritus work within the hugo and maybe i'm taking it too seriously but i i could imagine that if i had a movie that was on the cusp of being nominated and got knocked out for eurovision because somebody wanted to do a performance or or whatever the fans wanted to see a performance i would i would find that annoying and yeah I, I mean, I just learned about this here. So, and I, I don't have any problem with Sean McGuire and think she's a good writer and all that. I just, I just kind of think if that's exactly what she's doing, I don't think that's very cool in my opinion. Yeah. But I'm also not mad about it. I'm just saying like, I, you know, I had to watch this stupid movie for this reason, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, come on. Yeah. It uh, looks like Steve is leaving us. Hi, Steve. I think he might already be signed off. Okay, uh, I definitely want to hear from Paul just because of the vast uh, knowledge of all, all the films that you've seen um, and, and what you think might have been left off the list this year. Uh, yeah, I was just going to shout out to some of the smaller releases from 2020. Um, I, some of the other ones I really like got, got mentioned, like Possessor, uh, very uncompromising and very transgressive and beautiful and very brutal. Uh, Sputnik, uh, just fun Cold War monsters. I think we, um, I'm going to point out one called Psycho Goreman or PG. It's a sort of Canadian indie film with absolutely amazing um, effects and makeup and mm -hmm. costumes. And uh, from the guy who made The Void a couple 
a couple of years ago, Steve Kostansky. Um, just a brilliant little indie film about an ancient alien warlord who's imprisoned on Earth and he is accidentally released uh, by a little girl and she and this you know this creature has to obey what she says if she's holding this gem and it's just and mayhem ensues it's just just mm. beautiful it's really funny it's very gruesome it's just uh, so innovative just characters and costumes that just pop off the screen uh, mm. constantly it's, it's really something and, and also another shout out to one called come true um, which is like a local indie production about a girl who submits to a university sleep study. It's got some real, it's very low budget, but pretty good. It's got some real Cronenbergian vibes to it. Um, sort of an interesting kind of world where you have like analog CRTs existing alongside of iPhones. Got a cool mm. look to it. And uh, yeah, that, that's about all I got. There was some other ones that came out this year that were, you know, interesting, like Underwater, Alien set underwater, some great aesthetics, and you know, guest appearance by Cthulhu at the end, but didn't make really <laughs> much of an impression. But yeah, that's about oh, all I got. Oh, did you see Sea Fever? Did you see Sea Fever? Fever? No. Yeah, because I think it's a, like a better, it's a little better than underwater, but it's, it's kind of similar, but yeah. It's really good. It's not as quite as Lovecraftian, but it's yeah, definitely see 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 fever. S E A fever. I'm adding that to my watch list right now. Cool. Uh anything else from anybody uh wants to promote something that they think people should see? Otherwise we can wind down. And I do want to say this is really cool for me too, because Seth, Marshall, Steve, Lori, these are all voices I hear in my earbuds all the time from different podcasts. So it's, it's very fun to yeah. <laughs> be on a panel with everybody. So. Well, it's good having you. I, I guess uh, on that note, why don't we go, go ahead and start uh, signing off and um, start by letting people know where they can find you if they want to. Um, I, I know people did that at the beginning. I just want to make sure it gets covered at the end too. Uh, so Trish, I see that you're off uh, mute. So why don't you go first? I'll just say real quickly, I was going to nominate Space Sweepers, which is a dandy mm. little movie, but uh, it actually came out in February 2021. So that'll be mm. on my ball ballot next time oh, nice. uh, on my nominating ballot. Um, I'm uh, at P.E. Matson on Twitter is the easiest way to find me. I do have a blog, but it is irregularly maintained. So just uh, look, look for me on Twitter and I'll post whenever I blog. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, uh, let's see, Juan, why don't you go ahead and go next? Oh yeah, uh, unfortunately right now I'm, at, uh, I'm not on a podcast, uh, but you can find me on Twitter at RainbowWar71 and I'll try to be interesting. Okay. <laughs> All right, and then Lori? Uh, yeah, you can find the Hugo Girl podcast at Hugo Girl podcast on Twitter and Instagram. We're also on Facebook. Don't update quite as much there. Um, and then we can um, be reached by email at Hugo Girl podcast at Gmail. Nice. OK, then Marshall. Yeah, uh, Stephen and I uh, are part, uh, we are co-hosts of Androids and Assets uh, and also sort of a spinoff show now, uh, Emissaries of Profits, where we review uh, Deep Space Nine. Uh, every episode. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. Uh, you can find us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, Facebook at Asset Droid uh, on, on the internet, uh, androidsandassets.ca, uh, or feel free to email us, uh, info at androidsandassets.ca. Nice. All right, Paul? Uh, you know, I'm most active on Letterboxd. You'll find me under Paul Senior. That's Paul, S-E-N-I-O-R, just like the word. Nice. Uh, I'm definitely going to check out your, actually, I think I might've already followed you on, on Letterboxd. If I haven't, I will. Okay. David. Yeah. So uh, I have two podcasts that I do. Um, uh, my personal podcast is, um, sorry for the beeping. Uh, <laughs> my personal podcast is postcards from a dying world. And that I inter just, mostly interview whoever the heck I want to. So there's astronomers, there's horror writers, there's, uh, I'm interviewing a punk rock historian today, later today. So there's all kinds of interesting stuff there. But Dickheads, our main place you can find us is our SoundCloud has most of the episodes. 
And um, I just want to highlight, we recently did an episode where we interviewed one of Philip K. Dick's best friends, his ex-wife, and a Gnostic expert on the pink laser beam incident from 1974. And I'm really, really proud of that episode. Um, and uh, yeah, so check out Dickheads, please, because, um, and I'm happy to give you guys an exclusive we finally convinced Apple we're not a podcast about penises <laughs> and they're finally going to let us on, on Apple podcasts uh, okay. very soon. So it's the, the, the last hurdle we have to uh, get over before we are almost done doing the show altogether. So, but nice. we do deep dives into the history of science fiction. There's also episodes about Judith Merrill. There's episodes about Anthony Boucher and Don Wilhelm and all kinds of like, deep dives into the history. In fact, we covered most of the Hugo winners of the 60s novels already um, in a side series. And Stand on Zanzibar is the best science fiction novel of the 20th century. I will hear nothing else and I'm signing off. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, uh, Nana. Um, well, I have a Twitter account at K underscore Amua. I don't really have any like um, writing to promote on that front. I'd I don't really blog and I mostly um, just like stuff. I don't even retweet either. But um, me, Olaf, and uh, Cora Butler, um, we do make a point every year to try and uh, sort of rescue um, smaller films from the heap and push them forward at the Hugo Business Meeting for eligibility extensions. Um, this year, um, so far, we've done one for Psycho Gorman, which got a, a sort of wide release uh, 2021. 2020 was still on the festival circuit. Um, there's this uh, smaller uh, Japanese film we're working on, Beyond the Infinite Two Minutes, which is um, sort of hard to describe in like a short amount of time. But um, yeah, right now we're, we decided to call ourselves the Section 343 Posse because that's the <laughs> of the um, uh, Constitution that allows us to do that. But yeah, I'm to reiterate, I'm at K underscore Amo on Twitter. Cool. All right. Uh, last but not least, Josh. Yeah, so uh, I'm on Twitter at, at J-R-Z-E-F-L-E. Z -I -E -F -L -E. Um, most of the, some, at least some of the stuff you'd find online from me is, comes from my professional side. I'm a church historian and uh, an ordained minister, actually. So um, that's some of what I do. Uh, I do have a podcast and blog which are both kind of in hiatus because i got busy this fall um my pod my podcast is called christianity now which kind of uh tries to ask questions about faith in the 21st century uh and then um i blog at joshuazifel.com and just have some different professional stuff on there so that's me cool all right well i want to thank everybody for joining me for this um great to meet some new people paul and nana it was great to meet you um might have to try and get you guys on the main feed podcast even though i'm running out of titles to choose um but uh yeah i'd love to see you guys again and uh and everybody else thanks so much for doing this this was a lot of fun thanks for having thanks us for having us yep thank you, right. sir. thank you i'm gonna hit stop now <laughs>